uh, thank you, Architect Chong Wu Wee, our MC and moderator for today's seminar. Assalamualaikum and very good morning. Um, supposed to be Prem President, he's on his way now. And uh, PEM office bearers and council members and all participants in this hall and also on the virtual platform. It has been great to see all of you here attending a seminar on a not so popular topic of dispute resolution, especially on the third Saturday today, uh, third Saturday of December. Uh, and by the way, we have five Saturdays uh, this month. So we have two more Saturdays to go before we enter into uh, to 2023. Okay, uh, typically everyone will be very, very busy for uh, in December, with school holidays, school holidays outing, Christmas shopping, a close, and a closing of business account, and, and also uh, overseas trips. But however, uh, many of us uh, are able to be here today. So the latest information that I received was that the registration for this seminar is very encouraging. Surprisingly, we have a total registration at the closing time of 6 p.m. yesterday. It was 462. And we have a physical attendance of 123 and virtual platform 339. So uh, please give a round of applause to all of us. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, thank you. So I wish to thank the members of the organizing committee for this seminar, led by architect uh, Chu Heng Huat, the uh, co-chairman, and also the members of this uh, committee, uh, architect Anthony Lee, another co-chairman, and architect uh, Chung Wijin, architect Lee Jin Yu, and architect Chong Wun Wee, and also, uh, not to forget our PEM uh, project officer, Puan uh, Nosriati Sulong. They have been working very hard in one way or another for the last three to four months to prepare for the seminar. So that uh, is going as planned. And congratulations to the organizing committee for the uh, work or job well done. And uh, the four distinguished Speakers today are no strangers to the construction and dispute resolution world in Malaysia. Each of the speakers will look at the alternative dispute resolution in the construction industry from different angles and perspectives, and in particular concerning the PAM contract. So with years of experience on their belt, I'm confident, very confident that the selected topic for today, what you should know about dispute resolution in PAM contract, will be an interesting discourse. So ADR committee is pleased to invite all participants to join and support our future event and program to broaden and advance our knowledge on the intricacy of the construction world. And I hope everyone will enjoy the talk, have a good weekend in advance and stay safe wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zo, for your introduction. We've, um, today, we've actually got um, four very interesting speakers for you. Um, I'll introduce them individually when the time comes. Uh, there's gonna be a slight uh, change in the way we do the program today. We're supposed to actually have a moderating Q&A session after the final speaker has uh, finished his, her paper uh, this afternoon. Unfortunately, our first honorary speaker uh, Mr. Chang is not feeling too well, so we will, uh, in this instance, take Q&A uh, immediately after Mr. Chang's um, talk so that he can uh, leave and not stay for the Q&A session at the end, okay? So I would like to just give you a brief introduction that this, this seminar um, 
is an introduction to the alternative dispute resolution available in the construction industry, specifically concerning PAM contract. And it's related to the clauses in the PAM contract where it talks about arbitration, adjudication, mediation, and expert determination. The role of the contract administrator and what suitable dispute resolution shall be expected when the dispute happens. Nevertheless, the contract administrator shall and always be the quasi-arbitrator to resolve the dispute before it gets more intense. Okay. As such, the construction project can be completed accordingly. So let me start off by introducing the first honorary speaker. He is the past president of the Malaysian Institute Arbitrators. He is in the panel of arbitrators of Malaysia's AIAC as well as MIARB, and also in Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, and Dubai. He is a construction lawyer for more than 30 years, experienced in dispute resolutions in projects such as airports, hotels, oil and gas facilities, treatment plant, dam, and power station. He has received accolades and recognition in Chambers Asia Pacific and Asia Pacific Legal 500's leading lawyer in the field of construct dispute resolution. And Asia Law's profiles distinguished practitioner in construction law. His topic for today is called, very simply, Arbitration 101. Please may everyone put your hands together for Mr. Chang Wai Man. I don't know about you, but I hate this thing. The love-hate relationship, now it's more hate than love already. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me. It's indeed an honour and a privilege for me to be here. <clears throat> Actually, I'm very happy to be here. It's, uh, it's long since, it's been a long time waiting, but now I'm having more face-to-face -face talks, face-to-face -face hearings, and virtual ones where I stare at the screen and I look at myself. It's quite unnerving. Right? So this is a good change for me. I get to dress in a full suit rather than just the top and my bottom is a pair of shorts. Yeah? <clears throat> uh, first of all, Just a, 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 a little bit of a housekeeping. Huh? As you know, I'm not feeling well. As top progresses, I'll be coughing and coughing quite a lot. Uh, but no need to leave the room, no need to call an ambulance. I don't have COVID. I just have a bug. Right? <clears throat> uh, secondly, <clears throat> I. You may not know me because I'm actually not an architect, I'm a lawyer. So my preference is if you have a question for me, I don't mind being interrupted. Just put up your hand and we will try and deal with the question then. then. All right? Okay. Now, <clears throat> I have split my talk into four subtopics. Uh, firstly, why arbitrate? When I talk about this topic, uh, you, you will know have a basic idea of what an arbitration is and why parties choose to do this. In the second subtopic, the elements... Oh, this is very bad omen. No, no, no. I don't have COVID. It's okay. Okay, the second... <clears throat> when I talk about the elements of an arbitration, um... <clears throat> Mike is not cooperative. Okay. <clears throat> I'll be talking about what actually 
happens in an arbitration? What are the steps involved? Thirdly, the architect in arbitration. Right? Um, for those of you who have been in an arbitration, you are basically being called as a witness of fact uh, to actually defend the decisions you make as an SO. And lastly, I may not have time for this, PAM in arbitration, you know, the training, how PAM can popularize arbitration, how uh, you can actually move things forward eh, and uh, get more involved in arbitration. Uh, can I have the next slide? Yes. <coughs> okay. Firstly, why arbitrate? Now, <clears throat> 30 years ago, when I attended a talk like this, there was a list of about seven or eight reasons why people arbitrate. Fast forward 30 years, a lot of those reasons are not applicable anymore, right? Because <clears throat> Other forms of dispute resolution, which were not popular or not existent then, they have caught up, okay? And they are actually eating into the arbitration pie. But <clears throat> two things remain here on the advantages of arbitration. <coughs> Flexibility and freedom of choice. <clears throat> you see, in an arbitration, you actually choose your arbitrator. There's a lot of uh, wisdom in that because you can choose the person who is familiar with the dispute. Can you imagine if you have a construction dispute, you don't choose somebody who is an expert in hotel management, right? You choose a construction uh, uh, expert in that field. <clears throat> choosing the seat and choosing the rules, choosing the seat basically means choosing where to arbitrate. When you choose where to arbitrate, <clears throat> it means more than the geographical location. It means you're arbitrating in a place and you are actually adopting the laws of that place. So if you arbitrate in Malaysia, you have to arbitrate under the Malaysian Arbitration Act. If you arbitrate in Hong Kong, you'll have to arbitrate using the <clears throat> Hong Kong Arbitration Act and choosing the rules. Right? There are so many, so many rules for arbitration available now. Right? You have HAM is one of them. IEM, you have CIDB. Sorry, I'm concentrating on construction. And then you have the more generic ones, AIAC. SIAC, every country that does arbitration will have their own set of rules. <clears throat> and there's no reason why you can't adopt somebody else's rules. There's no reason why you are in the UK. Technically, you can adopt the PAM rules. You get a PAM, arbit uh, PAM president to appoint your arbitrator, right? But the problem is <clears throat> when you adopt the rules, the rules and the arbitration act uh, where you are holding the arbitration, they must talk to each other. If you don't think there'll be some inconsistency. Uh, that is why <clears throat> when uh, national bodies, they formulate their rules for arbitration, try and make it internationally acceptable. So if you're talking about, <clears throat> uh, say for example, if you can imagine arbitration, like a game of football, right? There's a referee and there are rules, football rules. You okay? play in a country, they have their own stadium, right? <clears throat> so the reason why moving forward, the rules of arbitration are getting to be more and more similar is because uh, countries have found out that it is profitable. Huh? actually have people arbitrate in your country. It's a source of foreign revenue. 
It's like having tourists, you know. Every US dollar that they spend in your country uh, is pure revenue. And in order to attract them, they must make their rules international. So imagine a football game. You want to make your rules FIFA. Right? Can you imagine you want to hold your, um, a World Cup in Malaysia? And then you tell everybody, oh, we are going to use the rules of the Salayang Football Club. Huh? Nobody will come. They're not familiar. Right? So if you look at the AIAC rules, you look at the SIAC rules, you look at the ICC rules, they are very similar already. You know why? <clears throat> Worldwide, the law is converging. And they are converging why? They are being led by the United Nations. The United Nations have come up <clears throat> with a blueprint to standardize arbitration worldwide. And they have come up with their recommendation of what your arbitration act should look like. And one by one, uh, everybody is trying to adopt that one, either totally or in part. In Malaysia, we adopted the United Nations model law in 2005. For that, our Arbitration Act 1952 was a dinosaur. So, <clears throat> choosing the seat is important because, <clears throat> easy to give an example. Let's say your client is SP Satya. They're building an integrated <clears throat> um, development. Say you can work there, you can live there, you can play there. It's got a shopping complex, it's got a block of condominiums, it's got an office block as well. And they send out tenders. And the company that gets the job is a main contractor from China. Normally, they are cost effective. <clears throat> Not like last time, they will just sign the contract. No, they will look through the terms. They've been bitten very badly by an arbitration clause, which says they have to arbitrate in a certain way, in a certain way. <clears throat> I'm a Chinese contractor. Okay? I would say I don't want to arbitrate in your home turf. Right? The language is not familiar to me. The procedures are not familiar to me. I want to bring my Chinese lawyer to come and argue the case if need be. <clears throat> now, of course, as the SP Satya will say, I, I want to hold it in Kuala Lumpur. And then there are negotiations. So that's why a lot of times, arbitrations emanating from projects in Malaysia are held in Singapore, which is next door, which is very convenient, or Hong Kong. Now, <clears throat> the reason the Chinese party will choose Hong Kong is <clears throat> a question of familiarity. And familiarity is important because <clears throat> you must understand it. <clears throat> <clears throat> our legal system is common law based and we have lived under common law all our lives and we think that's the best legal system but in actual fact <clears throat> most of the world doesn't don't agree with us the most popular legal system in the world is civil law right the most popular mode of resolving disputes is not adversarial you know? it's not like those courtroom that we see it is, uh, it, is, <clears throat> it is something that is alien to us. It is very much inquisitorial, right? And we're not talking only China. We're talking most of Europe, France, Germany. It's inquisitorial. It is civil law. So <clears throat> as far as China is concerned, the Chinese party is concerned, they would want to hold their arbitration in a civil law country that practices inquisitorial. That is why when a party is Chinese and when negotiating a contract with them, the compromise is Hong Kong. Why? Because Hong Kong has the best of both worlds. It's common law, right? And it's also civil law. <clears throat> we, we had an arbitration in real life situation. I had a client. Um, they were building a steel mill in Penang. <clears throat> And the Chinese contractor agreed to our arbitration clause. 
negotiated and we agreed on Singapore. Unfortunately, the case went to arbitration and in Singapore, uh, they brought an eminent lawyer from China. Right? And, uh, and at that point in time, the question to be decided is, how do we run the arbitration? Right? They appointed a Chinese arbitrator. Okay? He appointed a Malaysian arbitrator and both of them invited the uh, ex-chief judge of Singapore. Right? So we had a panel of three. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it was decided there was an argument. Huh? How do we run it? Do we do it inquisitorial? Or do we do it common law adversarial? Guess who won? Why? All right. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Okay, great. You, you couldn't just now, is it? Sorry about that. Okay. <clears throat> As, as time goes on, my voice will get hoarser and softer. So I'll try and hold the mic nearer. <clears throat> so guess who won? The tribunal said, look, why did you choose Singapore? You know very well our legal system is adversarial. Our legal system is common law. Right? So it's, it was quite... Unfortunate, because a Chinese lawyer, you know, being used to an inquisitorial system, his cross-examination skills were not the same as somebody from a common law jurisdiction. Same thing like that, when we had to do an arbitration in China, right? This is a real-life situation. We stood up, we wanted to cross-examine the witness, and the Chinese arbitrator said, what are you doing? I'm cross-examining the witness. Then, this was 20 plus years ago, I think. Then this is what the arbitrator said. Excuse me, that's our job. We're in China. It's inquisitorial. Have you seen the, I don't know how many of you, this is an old show, Justice Pao. That's how court proceedings in an inquisitorial system works. You know? The arbitrator asks the questions. It's an investigative... You heard of an investigative magistrate in France? That's what it is. The judge actually investigates, you know. So he said, you sit down. We ask the questions, right? And if at the end of the proceedings, if you feel like it, you can ask a few questions if you want. <clears throat> it's a culture shock. So that's why choosing the seat and choosing the rules are important. If you choose, let's say, Chinese arbitration rules, not all, huh? uh, the CTEC rules, you have to appoint an arbitrator from their panel. That means all three will be Chinese nationals. Can you imagine if you are a Malaysian developer and you have a project there? Right? Now, next. Okay. I have to keep track of time. <clears throat> is it faster or cheaper? The question is faster and cheaper compared to what? All right now, 30 years ago, it was faster. Cheaper, no, it was never be cheaper because uh, you, you, apart from paying the party representative, you also have to pay the arbitrator. <clears throat> but it was faster at that point in time. Then, as time progressed, it, other forms of dispute resolution popped up, which were much faster than arbitration. So last time, although the go-to method of dispute resolution in construction was arbitration, immediately when SIPA came into force, it was replaced by adjudication because adjudication is much faster. When I first started practice, you, you could never ever get a trial date in the high court. Now, trial dates are coming up very fast. And they can be even faster than arbitration dates, depending on the arbitrator. Last time, construction disputes, people are very wary of going to court because you step into a courtroom, the judge is going to decide your 50 million ringgit case, and he has never been on a construction site. 
He doesn't know when you say BQ, he doesn't know what you're talking about. Right? He's never seen one before. Fast forward 30 years, we have a construction specialist called two in KL, one in Sha'alam. <clears throat> Kim Chong Fong just got elevated, but he was the head of construction at that time. Before he got elevated, he was a construction lawyer and he was with Asman Davidson. He was very popular as an arbitrator. He was a QS who got a law degree and then practiced construction law. He was very, very popular, but you have to pay him. It was quite expensive. Now, you get him for, when he was elevated to the, as a high court judge in the construction court, now you get him for free. Much faster as well, because as a judge, he's got powers to put, I'm talking bad about lawyers, but yeah, lawyers can be very troublesome. They can try and delay things. Arbitrator, your powers are limited. You can scold them, but in court, you can put them in jail. So things move much faster in a court setting. So <clears throat> uh, arbitration, in a way, is losing ground in that respect. What other forms of dispute resolution cannot match arbitration? International is the, the international element. Is the enforcement. Say, for example, <clears throat> uh, the example that I gave earlier, SB Satya is uh, building an integrated uh, development and the main contractor is Chinese. Right? You could actually sue the main contractor in a Malaysian high court. The question is, once you get the judgment, how do you turn that into money? The Chinese contractor has no assets here. By the time you get your judgment, the project has completed, it's gone off, or it's been terminated. You want to chase him for the money, you've got to go to China. And in China, the judgment of the High Court is not very useful. But if you go for arbitration, you go for arbitration in Malaysia, or any of the 144, 45 countries that have signed the New York Convention, <coughs> The New York Convention is a contract <clears throat> between countries. When you sign the New York Convention, you are saying that any arbitration award obtained in any member country, I will respect and I will register in my own country as if it's a judgment of my court. So once you get an arbitration award, in Malaysia, and we are part of the New York Convention, we are a New York Convention country, then you can actually enforce it in 145 countries in the world. Right? So you can actually go to China, register it as a judgment of the Chinese High Court, and then you can execute. This part, as far as the international uh, element is concerned, that's why arbitration has gone from strength to strength to strength. It's no longer faster or cheaper compared to some other ways, flexibility is still there. Okay, let's move on. Don't know where the point is. Can I have the next? Yes. <clears throat> now we move on to the elements of an arbitration. Can I have a show of hands? How many of you all have actually been involved in an arbitration? I mean, stepped into an arbitration, either as a witness or as an arbitrator? Anybody? Okay, okay, and I chose the right topic, Arbitration 101. <clears throat> it won't be very pleasant for the architect, right? If you're the SO, you are challenging all the decisions that you made, right? So in a way, because there are so few hands raised, that means you have been a good SO. Yeah? You've been a good SO. The decisions you have made have not been challenged. <clears throat> Okay, so when you go into an arbitration, it is separated into distinct steps. First is the preliminary meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> That's where you meet the arbitrator for the first time. And uh, he sets the tone. At that meeting, you will know, <clears throat> actually as an arbitrator, 
they are told uh, it's a good idea to set the tone. And that's, you will know what type of arbitrator he is. No nonsense type, the more flexible one, the more uh, <clears throat> whether he will, uh, whether <clears throat> it's, it's good from the start to tell, tell the parties, you know, these, tell them, look, you know, we're going to fix a timetable and we will try our best to keep to it. If you look at the code of ethics for arbitrators, even the PAM one, you are obliged to save time and cost, right? So you have to, you know, try to come up with the most expeditious solution, time and cost, right? Because if you are not timers, timers, and if you are very costly, then arbitration will be a dinosaur. Nobody will want to do it, right? So you need to keep that into effect. So the preliminary meeting is to set a timetable. The timetable will say, <clears throat> Pleadings. The pleadings is like the original design in a building, the original drawings, the original specifications, the original bill of quantities. Yeah? That's the blueprint. If you can think of arbitration as a building, that's the blueprint of the arbitration, the pleadings, the claim, the defense and construction. 95%, 98% will have a counterclaim, and then uh, a reply and defense to counterclaim, and maybe a rejoinder. So you have always heard that parties are bound by their pleadings. It means that, you know, once you have the pleadings there, you cannot depart from your allegation. If you say your case is A, during the hearing, you cannot say it is A2 or A3. Maybe A2, A3, you may get away with it by enlarging the words you use in your, in your claim. Huh? But you turn it into B, won't be allowed. The arbitrator will have no jurisdiction. This jurisdiction is actually um, restricted huh, by what is in the pleading. So, and if you want to change halfway, you've got to apply to amend. In your construction scenario, it'll be a variation order. Right? Then, you will turn the, uh, your case into a little bit uh, different, uh, those are pleading. The preliminary, pre, uh, preliminary meeting will also fix a date for the filing of documents. Whatever anybody tells you in a construction dispute, the most important form of evidence are documents. All right, you need to bundle them. <clears throat> you need to put them into agreed and non-agreed. And there will also be, uh, most documents are exchanged voluntarily, right? <coughs> In a common law system, it is frank and full disclosure. And if you don't disclose and you think the other party is hiding something, you can actually apply for orders for discovery so that you force the other party to actually give them to you. Then you have to deal with witnesses. Most construction arbitrations, witnesses will give evidence by way of witness statement. So there will be dates for filing and exchange of witness statements. Then next comes the evidential hearing. The hearing <clears throat> is one of the main reasons why there is delay. Right? Because things like pleadings, documentation, witnesses, the award. It is within control. But when you have an oral hearing with witnesses, it's very subjective. You, you, you can have some that are really long-winded. <clears throat> really long-winded. <clears throat> so, you need to control what happens at an evidential hearing. Um, for international arbitration, it is very, very common now we have limited time, limited time, okay? So you will ask the parties as an arbitrator, how many days do you need? How many days do you need? Okay, I'll give you one extra, but you have to complete by then. I will give a direction saying that <clears throat> for those days, you have to give uh, more details, you know, on that day, which witness is coming, how long for cross-examination, how long for re-examination, and 
you try not to cross it. The other one that is becoming, as a matter of course, is hot tubbing. Hot tubbing has always been popular, but it's usually limited to experts. Get the experts to face off. And then <clears throat> um, the difficult part is who runs the hot tubbing? Can either be the arbitrator, right? Not my practice to do it unless it is an area of which I have some expertise as well. Say, for example, there are two expert engineers on both sides or an expert architect on both sides. And you're asking for an opinion as to, to A, right? Now, <clears throat> in order for me to run the hot tubbing, I have to ask relevant questions. I'm not an architect. I'm not an engineer. For me to know the questions to ask, uh, not a good idea. Unless it's a legal expert on foreign law, and then I will run it. <clears throat> There's another practice. This is from the Chartered Institute of the Arbitrators. Let the experts run it themselves. Not a good idea unless the experts are well-versed in arbitration. Right? If they've attended, if they've been an expert witness for 10 years and they've done so many arbitrations, maybe. The other one is counsel. Let counsel ask the questions. And the arbitrator plays the role of the referee. <clears throat> Lately, huh? sometimes issues of fact are also hot tub. Uh, I'm going to do my first one in March. I'll let you know how it turns out. So basically, <clears throat> uh, when it comes to extensions of time, there are a lot of factual disputes. You know? They're saying, oh, at that date, <clears throat> uh, the construction was up to that stage. No, it wasn't up to that stage. Uh, there's something inside the uh, progress reports. They're saying, no, 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 the progress reports are not accurate. So, you hot up, you get the project managers from both sides, okay, to sit down and now ask them point blank, you know. It says here, it is at this stage in your progress report. Are you saying it's wrong? Tell me why. Right? Now, you are saying it's not like this, it's like that. Why do you say so? Oh, okay. I got evidence on my phone. Now, here it is. You know, that kind of situation. Evidence on your phone. Why didn't you put it in a bundle of documents? Scold him a bit, you know. Uh, that kind of situation. But <clears throat> relatively new in Malaysia is hot tubbing for witnesses of fact. Um, then we have the award and its enforcement. Once everything is over, then the arbitrator writes the award. So basically, these are the elements of an arbitration. Now, any questions so far? Okay, let's move on. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the architect in arbitration. More often than not, <clears throat> the architect, uh, if it's a PAM contract, uh, you'll be the SO, right? And all throughout the project, you'll be making decisions. <coughs> no one will be totally happy, right? <clears throat> so if EOT application number two, uh, the contractor wants 150 days. And then um, the employer will say, look, I don't think he's entitled to 150. Then also good, uh, you know? And then you have to decide what to give. <clears throat> Loss and expense, uh, issues on variation orders, issues of CPC, and whether a uh, certificate of non completion ought to be issue. These are hotbed topics. Okay. Any decision that you make as an SO has severe monetary consideration. So because of that, these are the issues, the same issues that will be decided at the arbitration. And these are the issues that have already been pre-decided by the SO. Okay. So the objective, uh, the objective of the contractor's lawyer uh, is to say that 
the architect was wrong. Right? And they'll be planning. That's why it's not pleasant for an architect to be in arbitration. They'll be planning ways and means uh, to get you to admit you're wrong or to prove that you're wrong. You know? <clears throat> Whereas on the other hand, the employer's um, lawyer will be to say that you are right. You are right 110%. Right? <clears throat> and sometimes, uh, not often, sometimes employers and sometimes against legal advice, they want to challenge their own architect. Right? Uh, application for EOT was 150 days. The SO, the architect, as agent of the employer, granted 60 days. Right? The employer will say, no, it should have been 30. Because that extra 30 days will come up with loss and expense uh, of 400,000 ringgit. And it will cause uh, liquidated damages to the purchasers uh, of 1.1 million ringgit. Because they are like 200 units of a condominium. Right? So it's money. Right? Now, <clears throat> when that happens, they will be cross-examining you. We put on the stand. Okay. We'll be put, there'll be hot issues, you'll be on the hot seat. Now, there are different personalities in an arbitration. There'll be expert witnesses. The contractor will come up. <clears throat> expert witnesses in a construction dispute, there are two types delay experts and quantum experts. Right? So the delay experts will come up with critical path analysis, uh, because of the critical path analysis, the contractor will say, actually, he sent out to 150 days. Uh, why? Uh, and, uh, and the critical path analysis uh, by the employer's expert is wrong because of this and that. <clears throat> and you will be caught in the middle. <coughs> you will be caught in the middle. Why did you give 60 days? Did you consider this? Did you not consider this? Right? So oh, it's good that you stick to your guns. As a professional, you, you have to defend, unless it is in defense, unless you actually made a mistake. All right? All right? If you actually made a mistake, tell the lawyer from the start, you know, it's going to be hard to defend because I, that day I, I was a bit, you know, I got up on the wrong side of the bed. I was very unhappy with the contractor, so I just slashed, you know, that, that kind of thing, you know. <clears throat> I not to do that because it will affect you. But... <clears throat> You need to work with the expert witnesses. Yeah. You need to work with the lawyers or the party representatives. At a construction site, in a construction meeting, right? You chair the meeting. Right? In an arbitration, the chair is actually the party representative because he's the one who came up with the design for the arbitration. He's the one who came up with the strategy. And he's the one who is supposed to implement the strategy. And so everybody else is playing a role and the party representative, he's the conductor, you know, and you have to make music. Right? So there'll be a meeting between all the witnesses and they'll come up with a game plan and they will ask all the witnesses, okay, this is a dispute of fact. It should be like this, right? It should be A. Everybody says A, ah, correct? A, correct. A, A, correct. Okay. You sign your witness statement. Don't lie at the hearing. Uh, actually, it's B. That's a lawyer's nightmare. You know? right? That's a lawyer's nightmare. You have to work together and you have to have a strategy and common thread. Wow. Okay. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> now, I think there's a lot that PAM can do for arbitration. The question is whether you want to or you don't want to. All right. Now, I was involved in the Malaysian Institute of Arbitrators. We are scratching our heads, you know, how to make ourselves more relevant. Right? We don't have the resources, we don't have the members, we don't have the cloud. Right? So we decided to work together with the AIAC. But look at PAM. You have both the hardware and the software. 
look at your infrastructure, look at this building, you can actually have an arbitration center. The question is how far you want to take it. If you ask me, the pioneers of arbitration are architects. The AIAC uh, was formerly the KLRCA, the Kuala Lumpur Regional Center for Arbitration. They were formed in 1976. PAM was doing arbitration since 1969. PAM 69 had an arbitration clause. The pioneers in, uh, when I practice, when I start, first started practice as a construction lawyer, that was in the mid 80s. Most arbitrators were architects. Most arbitrations were PAM arbitration. The trailblazers during those days uh, was the late KC Chiang, W. Y. Chin. I think the first book on arbitration written by a Malaysian, or arbitra uh, Malaysian is by KC Chang. He had a booklet, a handbook on arbitration. He's an architect. So now, that's generation, sorry, 80s cannot be generation one. Huh? Maybe that's G3. Now we're talking G5. Huh? I'm looking at a future generation of PAM arbitrators. Right? <clears throat> so, um, you are already doing training and development. But the problem with uh, training arbitrators, uh, okay, in an arbitration, there are three elements. Issues of law, can't run away from it. Uh. There will be issues of law. Right? How to interpret the PAM contract. You should be quite familiar. There should be training on that. There are a lot of cases that come about, right? And issues of fact. Issues of fact, architects have no problem because the construction site is your second home, right? You deal with these issues every day, right? It will be a problem for lawyers, but not for architects, right? The third is procedure. Procedure is important. Why? The most common reason for setting aside an award is not because the answer is wrong. You know? right? It's not because there's no appeal. It's setting aside. The most common reason for setting aside an award is wrong procedure. You didn't respect your own jurisdiction. Right? You, you use evidence that was not presented by the parties. You breach the rules of natural justice. You know? It's important. Right? <clears throat> the problem about training in, <coughs> I like to give this example. Arbitration is a practice. It's like riding a bicycle. Right? You can train a person, you can go to university to study how to ride a bicycle. You can go off to PhD. But you put him on a bicycle, he'll still fall down. Yeah? Why? You need to ride it. You need to find the balance. And that one, nobody can teach you. You actually got to fall down and learn. Yeah? Right? So the problem is, how do you give training like that? You know, you, Pam has, an, uh, has a reputation, right? Sorry, yes. Oh, three more minutes, sorry. No EOT. You don't give, I'll go to Miss Manaha and apply for one. <coughs> okay. <Whoa. laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> um, so the reputation of PAM is that if the president appoints an arbitrator from PAM, you're actually telling the whole world that this person is ready to go. You need to increase your pool of arbitrators. How are you going to get young ones? You know? right? How are you going to expose them? Like I said, compared to MRR, you, you have the numbers, you have the infrastructure, you have the hardware, you have the software. Perhaps you should actually uh, come to a situation whereby it is a matter of practice, standard practice, that PEM arbitrators have to bring along an understudy to attend not the whole arbitration, but at least the preliminary meeting where there are arguments, tell them how to manage an arbitration. Now maintaining standards and services, that, <clears throat> that is for sure. I remember last time, uh, 
when we have a PAM arbitration, my main grouse uh, is that you force us to go to your old Jalan Tangsi building. And your arbitrations are on the first floor. You know? And you have this staircase that creaks. You know? And we have 300 bundles to carry up the stairs. You know? All right? Now, things are different. You have all this. Take advantage of it. All right? The service that you provide must be very good. <clears throat> Pam, you have a niche market. Don't compete with the IAC. The IAC is one of Tama. Right? Okay. You are maybe Harvey Norman. You specialize in a particular market. Okay. Thirdly, you need to promote uh, PAM arbitration. Like I said, uh, there's nothing stopping somebody from the UK to use PAM arbitration rules. In. The one that has really penetrated the market uh, is the American Association of Arbitration. In short, it's called the AAA rules. They're an organization just like PAM. But they are worldwide, no? Why? All right. They have catered somebody at AAA uh, had a vision to go global. Right? And they started training for that. They started uh, providing services for that. And they can match anybody. Right? So the question is, as far as PAM is concerned, where do you want to go? Is it just service that you provide by the way? Okay. Or do you want to take it further? Am I up? It's not a site service. It's a Malaysian Institute of Arbitrators. Our core principles is to promote arbitration. Even then, you have problems. You don't have infrastructure. You have. You don't have financial resources, you have. You don't have so many things that you have. Right? So the question is, what do you want to do with it? Like I said, in the mid-80s, when I began practice, uh, the market, uh, most arbitrations were PAM, you know, most. Right? Now, you find that disputes are being resolved in different arbitrations. Now, the very hard to compete with AIEC because they have government backing. They have the backing of a statute, you know. But it doesn't mean you cannot. Right? Okay. Uh, any questions for me? Any questions from the floor over there? Uh, yeah. Most painful experience. <clears throat> I had an arbitration in Singapore. Painful because of cultural differences. Right? You mustn't think you are right, you know. The world is very different. Right? So <clears throat> there was a situation where the arbitration was in Singapore. The parties, one was from India, one was from United Arab Emirates, it's, and another one from the Cayman Islands or something. Like. They, they wanted a tax haven. It's a project in India. Right? The lawyers are from India. I don't mean no disrespect. Okay? It's just that they do things differently. You know? In Malaysia, um, we have certain codes, certain ways of doing things. But in India, if you practice law in India, it's very different. It's very different. So, when they make an application and I say no or yes, I expect them to respect it and move on. You know? No, they will say, no, have you considered this? Can you do this? Have you done this? And I say, yes, I have. Uh, move on. Still not satisfied. They'll ask again and again. You know? So I decided, okay, I will punish them. And it goes on every day, you know, application after application, and they don't agree on anything. Right? So every week, there's a new application. So I said, I'm going to punish them. You make an application, I will issue a direction. You put in your written submissions in 48 hours. I thought that would work and deter them. But no, you know, it came in. It made it worse. I don't know where they find the time, but it's 
80, 90 pages each side, I have to read it and make a decision. Since I told them, you have to give me your written submissions in 48 hours, I also have 48 hours to decide. And I have to read all that, you know. They don't sleep. So it went on. Oh, oh, it's uh, very trying, very trying. I think in different jurisdictions, luckily in Malaysia, most of the things, they will agree, right? You want an extension of time, the other side will agree the first time, second or third time, he will put his foot down. <laughs> that arbitration, I don't know whether it's that particular lawyer. I don't think so. Both are equally the same. Huh? <clears throat> they won't agree. Even from the get-go, they won't agree. The, the other painful experience, again, is uh, international arbitration. The chair was from Korea. And uh, the witness actually said, can I have an adjournment? My father is ill. He's in the hospital. I mean, Malaysian arbitrator, I would say yes. The other two, different, you know, they, they come from different jurisdictions. Their mindset is different, you know. And they said, look, uh, no, we're not granting the adjournment. You come on Monday. On Saturday, got an email and says, sorry, uh, sir, the the main witness, the father, just died. And we have the adjournment now. The answer was still no. I was outvoted, but again, it's an eye-opener. Things are done differently. So, I, because of those experiences, I become tougher as well. If I have an arbitration uh, outside of Malaysia, and the parties come from different parts of the world, I won't leave until everything is finished. If you cannot finish, you want more time, you will sit on the weekends, we finish it. I also want to come home. Yeah, sorry. Uh, any other questions? There is a question. Yes. Um, someone typed virtually. Yes. And the question says, how can an architect be an arbitrator in Malaysia? Maybe you can you want to give a general answer? This one might be more suitable for the, for the later moderation. Okay. I think the first thing is, you know, um, I think the difficulty is getting your first appointment. Like I said, you know, you know all the theory. You've passed all the exams. Uh, MIR, CIR, SIR, you've got into all the panels, but to get someone to trust you with a 50 million claim or even a 5 million claim when you have never done a single arbitration. In MIR, <clears throat> You have a policy. You want to get into our panel, you must have written at least two awards. It's not written, but we know. Because when we put you on the panel, we are telling the whole world that this guy can arbitrate. And if you, it's like riding a bicycle. You've never gone on a bicycle, you know. You read books about riding a bicycle, right? <clears throat> I, th I think the easier one is to get an organization to appoint you, to appoint you as an arbitrator. For architects, you'll be PAM, right? If you can get, if you pass the exams and you're on the panel of AIAC, your first appointment can be there. For architects, it's a bit more difficult. For lawyers, especially construction lawyers, it's easier. You are in the market. You've been doing this day, day in, day out. For lawyers, usually your first appointment is either from the AIAC or the parties upon you, right? They know you, they think you can handle the job. You've been counsel for 20, 30 years. They think you can handle the job and that's how you get it. After the first one, after the second one, then the third and fourth and fifth becomes so much easier. But to get your first one, that is a problem. Any other questions from the floor? If not, um, let's thank Mr. Chang Roy Man for his delightful talk and uh, perspective from the legal facility. Thank you very much.
everyone. Uh, we've been graced with the presence. We've been graced with the presence presence of our PAM president, uh, Associate Professor Architect Sali Adre Sakum. Please uh, welcome him on stage for him to give us his uh, speech for today. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll just hold it. <laughs> Very good morning, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Wunwi. Um, of course, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Azul, Chair for ADR, and of course, uh, yeah, his co-chair, Architect uh, Daniel, and all of my council members here, uh, Anthony, um, and the, of course, the honorable speakers. <clears throat> Sorry. Myself and uh, Mr. Chang, we have something in common. I'm really not well, <laughs> but as a show of support for the very, very, very important um, agenda of alternative disputes uh, in PAM, I, I decided that it, it is important for me to make an appearance and give the commitment that uh, council actually um, wants to move forward with uh, making uh, all these ADR uh, issues and back of house uh, cleaning uh, and imperative that we are moving forward. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, as you may well know, next year, Pam will be celebrating our 100 years of architectural profession in Malaysia. We'll be celebrating 100 years of Pam. And uh, with that kind of progress, also has its pitfalls. Throughout the history of construction, projects are becoming more complex, of, often involving multiple parties and different interests, as Mr. Chang mentioned just now. Disputes are not un uncommon in the industry, and they can be costly, time-consuming, and stressful to all involved. <laughs> yeah, especially the architects, as it's challenging all the SO's decision. Disputes and dis disagreement can arise, and it's important to have effective ways to resolve them. I think that's where uh, alternative resolution methods come into play. Uh, these methods allow parties to resolve disputes outside of the traditional court system through means such as arbitration, adjudication, mediation, and expert determination. So why uh, alternative resolution methods are so important? Uh, simply put, they offer a way to resolve disputes without the need for costly, but sometimes maybe costly, time-consuming legal proceedings. This can help to preserve relationships, reduce costs, and allow projects to move forward without delay. But uh, most importantly, they offer a way to resolve the disputes in a more collaborative and constructive manner, rather than relying on the more uh, adversarial court system or legal system. Alternative uh, resolution methods can provide a forum for parties to work together and find mutual acceptable solutions. Yeah? And after that, can still be friends and work together. Um, of course, arbitration is the primary thing that we are looking here. This is a process which uh, an independent third party called an arbitrator is appointed to hear both sides of the dispute and make a binding decision. This can be quicker and more cost effective way to resolve disputes than going to court and it can at times be less adversarial. Uh, another alternative resolution method is of course adjudication. This is a process where a neutral third party is appointed to make a binding decision on a dispute. Adju adjudication is often, uh, in is often used in construction projects in Malaysia as it's provided under the Construction Industry Payment and Adjudication Act, the SIPA Act of 2012. And of course, uh, we have mediation. Mediation is another uh, alternative dispute me resolution method uh, that can be used in all the construction disputes. This is a process in which the neutral third party called the mediator helps the parties reach a mutually agreed upon resolution to their dispute. Mediation can be a less formal and more collaborative way to resolve disputes. 
and it can help parties maintain working relationships yeah after the dispute has been resolved as it is less adv ad adversarial um and of course we have our uh, newest thing which is expert determination which is actually not so new uh it, it's of course another resolution method this is a process where an expert in a particular field is appointed to make a binding decision in the in the dispute the expert's decision is based on their expertise and knowledge of their specific subject matter in that dispute so the pam contract 2018 um, is widely used in the industry and provides a framework for resolution of disputes them for all the four of the above <clears throat> in conclusion uh, i think alternative resu resolution methods such as arbitration, adjudication, mediation, and expert determination can be useful way to resolve construction disputes in a quicker, more cost-effective, and less adversarial manner. Whether you are a contractor, subcontractor, and of course, an architect or a client, it is important to be aware of the different alternative resolution methods that are available to you and to consider using them in an appropriate circumstance. I hope today's events will be beneficial to you in understanding all these relevant topics. Yeah. And I wish uh, everyone the best. Thank you, speakers, for making time for today. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our PAM president for making his time today, even though he's clearly not well. And also Mr. Chang Weiman as well, just now, for giving us his uh, uh, very personal perspective of arbitration from a, the perspective of a legal fraternity. Uh, the next speaker we have for you today um, is a past chairman of Chartered Institute Arbitrators Malaysia. He is an architect, an urban planner, an adjudicator, mediator, and a chartered arbitrator. He has given his statement of belief that the nature of construction and diversity of players in the construction industry makes it unavoidable for consultants to be involved with dispute resolution in one way or another. In other words, it's inevitable to be in dispute. It will be an interesting topic from uh, the next speaker, whose topic is Adjudication 101. Please give a round of applause to Mr. David Chia. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on a Saturday morning. Either a lot of you still need the CPD points, or there's no World Cup last night. I think that's the reason why. All right. Um, before I start, uh, just some, uh, I just want to get some audience uh, participation. That's the whole idea. Who say, uh, who's for Argentina? Can I know? So just put up your hands. Just put up your hands. Argentina? Oh, not many. Eh? France? Oh, even worse. Okay. So Argentina, fine. All right, I'll, I, later on I'll tell you why I, I, I need to see all of you uh, sort of uh, participate. Okay, let's, uh, I'm here to talk about mediation, uh, not sorry, adjudication. Uh, basically, uh, adjudication itself is a fairly new process, yeah, ADR process that's uh, ahead of its time. It was in the 2006 contract, yeah, but unfortunately at that time, nobody knew what, what adjudication was right, and now with SIPA or the our SIPA or Adjudication Act, everybody seems to have heard of adjudication. So it was ahead of its time. Now um, let's look at where we are in terms of the industry. All right, uh, we are just one of the players yeah, in the industry itself. Again, our industry is if you look at it, yes, you have developers who are financially unstable. Again, they don't really know what they're doing yeah not many of them are so professional the public listed ones are but the rest are really just you know if you want to call it that trial and error developers or the not so serious developers they're there all right the good ones are already there and they know what they're doing so again you find that traditionally you have arbitration litigation these are the two things to the two uh, modes to resolve disputes again the issue is of course the cost and the time it takes too long yeah so that's another issue then you have other things like remedies. How do you suspend your work, direct payments? It's again, very difficult to enforce. Yeah? So that's that issue. And again, you have this forever. Yeah? The, the big guy, the one with the power is always pressing the little guy, which is the contractor. 
And of course, the contractor to get the job will promise you the sun, the moon, the earth. All right? But in reality, can't can be delivered. All right? So that's how you know, our industry is. Now, if you look at what's happening in the industry, you find that, yes, we unfortunately, architects are always drawn in. You are caught in the middle. Yeah? Always accusations of delay. You have under, undervaluation yeah, of your payment certificates. Withholding of payment, non-payment. Yeah? Again, you have issues of uh, you know, delays. Yes, there will be delays in completion, progress of, of uh, projects as well. Insolvency issues, liquidation, very common nowadays. Yeah? Unfortunately, brought about by also COVID. So a lot of contractors are also dying. Unfortunately, and of course, abandoned projects, which you know we've had so many. You look at the newspapers; they have always complained, abandoned, abandoned project, but nobody has come in to revive them. So again, we have this legacy yeah, in our industry. So this is our industry, yeah, the construction industry, as we all uh, know it. All right. So you look at it. Yes, that is how we exist. Yeah, and of course. At the end of the day, after the job is finished, the architect is on the left, all right? That's the architect trying to collect his fees. So that's how it is. Okay, this is where uh, the audience participation will come in. Historically, if you look at it, it's faster and cheaper without lawyers. Try to resolve disputes without lawyers. But unfortunately, um, the only self-help you have is in the contract itself. What does the provision of the contract have and how does it, the mechanisms in the contract itself to resolve all these disputes? It's faster, it's cheaper, definitely. Yeah? So what has happened to PAM? If you look at it, PAM in Malaysia is the only contract that has so many modes, different modes, yeah? other than adjudication arbitration. You have mediation, you have expert determination. If you look at it, clause 34, 35, 36, 37. Okay, that's in the contract, right? So we've gone backwards. I mean, we started with arbitration first, right? Not gone backwards, but we started arbitration and we're going, moving along, okay? Now, if you look at some contracts, they tell you it's a, if you want to call it multi-tier dispute resolution. In other words, you have to start step A, then step B and step C and so on. Then you get ultimately to the last step, which is arbitration, all right? So in Pam's case, uh, it's quite interesting, yeah? How many of you here say that you need to go through mediation to get ultimately to arbitration, adjudication and arbitration? Anybody? Yes? No? No. Who says yes? No? Everybody says, okay. So you don't have to. All right, let's see. Okay, so it's not a condition precedent. In other words, you can skip mediation and go to the end. All right? All right, now expert determination. That's also a new provision. How many of you say that you have to go through expert determination to get to the end, adjudication arbitration? Anyone? No? Okay. Also, not. So you can skip expert determination and go to the end. Right? Adjudication. Do you need to go through adjudication to get to arbitration? Anybody? Yes? No? No? Yes? Oh, yes, you have to go through adjudication to get to, uh, okay, F1, all right. Okay. Yes, you have to, in terms of adjudication now, for PEM 2018, adjudication is for set-offs only, all right? It's very narrow, it's focused for set-offs only. So you have to set off something, yeah? And then you have to go through adjudication for, before practical completion, all right? So that's how it works. Before practical completion, if you want to set off certain uh, items, yes, you can do so, but it has to be before practical completion. All right? Arbitration, of course, we know. Yeah. Now, in terms of uh, set offs, again, you can arbitrate, but after practical completion. So that's how the contract works. All right? Questions? Any questions? No? All right. So it's flexible. So the contract itself, the PEM, the drafters of the PEM contract 2018 have left it flexible. It's not mandatory. So you can, you know, customize it, whatever, however way you want to do it, as long as uh, it's, you can, it, it still gets you to the end, but you can skip all the different ADR methods to get to the end. So that's what the contract does, all right? Now, 
if you look at it, there are basically three types of adjudication. Yeah? One is ad hoc. Second one is contractual, which is the PEM contract. PEM contract is contractual. All right. The third one is statutory. Statutory is what we know as uh, SIPA. All right. Our SIPA Act. Okay. Ad hoc is generally, if you look at it, consensual. In other words, if there is a dispute that happens today, people, the parties want to go into uh, adjudication, they can do so voluntarily. So they enter into a, an agreement, whether it's orally or by writing. I think writing will be preferable and they can have the dispute uh, adjudicated. Again, there is, uh, in, if you look at uh, there's standing adjudication as well, which is in Philippe, so it's quite interesting. Yeah? So when there's a dispute on site, they get the adjudicator there. Now, contractual is our PEM uh, contract, clause 36, where if you look at it, it says so, yeah, it's quite uh, expressly stated in the contract itself, only set-offs, right? That's what it does. The procedures and all that will come later. I'll go through that with you. And it may or may not be a condition precedent. So again, if you want to uh, adjudicate set-offs, you have to do it before practical completion. Otherwise, you wait until after practical completion. Then you can go and arbitrate. All right, so that's how it works. Statutory, again, if you look at it, our SIPA. Yeah, I think most of you, how many of you have heard of SIPA? Okay, how many of you have used? All right, sorry, I have to speak louder. Okay, how many of you have used uh, SIPA? All right, so do you find it effective? Yes? No? Okay, for fees, I suppose it's for fees, right? Yeah, okay, good. So again, if you uh, look at the SIPA, yes, you, architects normally use it for fees. Yes, it's, it's great for fees, all right? But the rest of it, well, we, we can discuss later what, what is the problem with SIPA, okay? So that is uh, how the system works. Now, in terms of uh, statutory adjudication, of course, it is it overrides everything else, yeah? It overrides your ad hoc adjudication and also the contractual adjudication. So basically, if you look at it, your PEM adjudication, contractual adjudication process, it exists side by side with uh, SIPA, the statutory uh, adjudication, however, uh, it's largely been overshadowed. Yeah? It's overshadowed by uh, SIPA, unfortunately. So um, that is also the reason why it's not so popular yeah? or it's very uh, unpopular. Reasons will, uh, we'll discuss the reasons later. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, adjudication, what is it? Yeah, if you look at the characteristics of adjudication, it's supposed to be quick, informal. Yeah, don't negotiate. It's either contractual or statutory, as uh, what we discussed earlier or shown earlier. Yeah, and uh, it can be both inquisitorial and adversarial. Inquisitorial just means that the adjudicator is actively involved. Yeah, in questioning, you question and you decide and try to determine who is telling the truth between the two or which version you prefer. Yeah. Adversarial is just like a normal system in court. Yeah? You are just a referee. The two sides are in the ring, so you're just watching them. So that's uh, adversarial. And it's a short time frame okay, for making decisions. So it's just an intermediate or interim solution. Basically, that's uh, adjudication. Now, what are the aims of adjudication? Of course, generally, let's look at, you have to look at it uh, in, in the big picture. Yeah? What is it supposed to do? Yes, improve payment processes, of course. Yeah, cash flow as well. There's a default payment mechanism. What do you do if there is a, an absence of uh, contractual terms or the terms are not so clear? Yeah, and as a ADR procedure, it's supposed to be fast and cheap. Yeah, and of course, it makes you uh, makes uh, recovery of payment. You can collect your money faster. That's that's the aim of adjudication. All right, but as we know, uh, again, the system is there. Uh, Sometimes, yes, ideally is to help you resolve issues, but the problem is because of the numerous actors and different interests in the system itself, you'll find that it's not as simple as it looks, all right? Okay. okay, let's look at the impact of adjudication itself to consultants, yeah? Generally for us, I mean, construction professionals, you look at it, yes, what is our role? Yeah, to do certification, to value yeah, the work done. That's our role, basically. Yeah? So again, what's expected of us? Of course, you improve your professionalism. Yeah? And of course, your 
your in practice as well, you are supposed to have a certain uh, well SOP. You want to call it SOP, fine in in your office or how you operate. There should be there. So you just follow that and you're fine. Yeah. So you won't you won't be in trouble. Again, the default is of course this breach of contract. Your client will come after you or your negligent. Okay. Worst case, your negligent. So again, that's something you have to be aware of as uh, practitioners. Now, of course, because of all these things, you need PI insurance. I think, how many of you have actually PI insurance in this room? Oh, all right. Okay. Quite a fair amount. How many of you are thinking of getting PI insurance? Oh, okay. All right. So uh, I think in, in the current uh, day and age, I think it is uh, I think recommended, highly recommended. I think Pam will also recommend that all practitioners try to get PI insurance. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, again, as construction professionals, you have the opportunity to become adjudicators yeah? under, uh, under CIPA. I mean, you can register yourself with AIAC and be on their panel, right? And to do adjudication support work. Now, the problem, the interesting thing is as construction professionals, again, architects, I, I think they have a problem. Right? It's not their cup of tea, unfortunately. Right? If you look at the statistics, 2016, there are only 11, 11 architects on the panel, adjudicators in AIAC, 11, 2016. Now, we are, five years later, can you guess how many? Anybody take a guess? Is it still 11 or more? I'll tell you, you only have 16 now. Five years later, you have 16, 16 architects, okay? So again, 16 architects, total panelists, huh? you're talking about roughly 634. So there's only 2%. 2% of you are adjudicators in the panel itself. All right, 2%, okay? And adjudication, SIPA was set up for payment disputes, okay? To assess payment, to recommend payment, uh, again, to contractors, uh, subcontractors, but that's, uh, that's the statistics. So unfortunately, we are not so, I think, keen on adjudication. Yeah? You have to look at it. Why? QSs, you have 52. There are 52 QSs in the panel now. So they are more than architects and roughly percentage-wise, 8%. We are 2%, they are 8%. So, you know, it's not uh, everybody's cup of tea. That's fine. Uh, so you have to understand that. So now, if you have, uh, again, what are, what's the impact to the others? Claims consultants, there are claims consultants coming up yeah? and lawyers, okay? So again, they look at it as opportunities, work opportunities, yeah? And uh, some of them want to be adjudicators. Some of them just want to do support work for adjudication. So again, then you have uh, issues of, uh, again, with new, uh, with adjudicators as well, whether they think that, yes, it's another way to find work, Yes, but those people in adjudication will have to then realize that they have to be competent and they have to maintain integrity and professionalism. Okay, of course, as an adjudicator, you are immune against any action or suit, and provided whatever you do is in good faith. Yeah. So again, as uh, you know, in PAM, we encourage all of you or more architects to be adjudicators. Yeah. After all, we also need your help to clean up the mess that you created. So that's that's the reason why we, we need you to, to actually come in. Yeah? And uh, it's a, uh, sometimes you know, people complain, I want an architect, I want an adjudicator with construction experience, but the way it's, uh, the system is at the moment, majority are lawyers. So you will find that more than 50, 60% will be lawyers. So again, if you get uh, your fees, let's say your dispute for fees, it goes to a lawyer, how would the lawyer be able to decide how much your fees are? Right? So that's another problem in the system itself. So you have to come forward to at least uh, contribute to the system itself and try to improve the system for the rest. Yeah? So again, it's up to you. Yeah? I think it's important. Otherwise, you find that, how come I've only got so much in terms of my claim? How come I can't get more? Well, because the lawyer doesn't understand how you calculated your fees. So you lose out. So you have to think of things like that. All right? So in terms of your contract administration, let's look at contract documentation first. So again, you have to make sure that all your terms are, you review them, you revise them, you make sure that they comply with SIPA. Now, SIPA itself, you have to remember, it's for payment. 
So if anything that in your contract that stops payment or makes it temporary, in, a, in other words, the contractor has done the work, they have to be paid. If there's something in there that stops payment, then it's contravention in contravention of SIPA. So you have to understand that. Yeah. So that's how the courts see it. So again, you, you just can't say our PEM contract is this, is great, but the courts interpret it differently. Yeah. They unfortunately that's their job. Yeah. You might think that this is the intention of the contract, but the judges always look at it differently. Yeah. So again, they might look at the language you use. Sometimes it's just to them, it's uh, you know common sense to them. So again, it depends. Yeah, how they look at it. So you might have a judge that doesn't understand the construction industry. So A, interpret the contract differently. So again, it's a, I call it litigation risk. You go to court, doesn't mean you're going to win 100%. There's always a risk. Yeah? And something could be, uh, the judgment could come out really different, really weird judgment. That's how it is. Yeah? So again, you look at the terms of uh, your contract. If it's in contravention or it contradicts SIPA, then you have to revise, remove it. So that end of the day, you do not obstruct payment. Payment has to be made as well. All right, PEM has done that. I think their contracts uh, uh, team has always looked at that and try to keep up with uh, whatever decisions in court that have come up. So they've done that. All right. So again, is to be aware of what's happening in court. Contract administration. This is the part that all of us have a uh, uh, you know have a role to play in terms of payments variations. Now, again, you look at it. Yes, how do you certify your claims? How do you review them? How do you process them? How do you honor them? And that, that, the, whole, the whole procedure in your office as well. Do you just accept what the QS has, has given you or do you say, no, let's look at it? I, I, it depends on all of you. It, different people have different ways of practicing. Nowadays, I think the, the standard is just accept 100%. Whatever the QS, uh, what's the valuation? Okay, fine, I accept it 100%. Yeah. I mean, that's the reality of it. You all are so busy. So obviously you don't have time to even look at it anymore, right? Then uh, also keep proper records, documents, okay? That's also important. And uh, you follow your proper procedures. So it's following good contract administration practice, whatever that means to all of you here, right? What is good practice is up to you, right? Other things, of course, uh, things that you must be aware of or you should be aware of, but you have no control over, whether the owner actually has enough money to pay the contractor, you don't know. Yeah, he's not even paying you. So how do you know that he's got enough money? All right. All right. Then again, how how does the process work? The payment process. Okay. Who knows? Yeah. So again, awareness. The contract. The owner must be aware of. You know. Again, if he doesn't comply, doesn't pay, what's going to happen to to him? And to, of course, to all of you, you'll be dragged in as well. Yeah, in SIPA. That's how it is. So the challenge in adjudication is, of course, complex uh, disputes and value-wise, big, big disputes. Yeah? Again, it's not, it's not uh, practical when you look at it. You are trying to claim 100 million, 200 million using adjudication. So sometimes you look at it, it's virtually impossible. Right? But they still want to use adjudication because it's cheap. Yeah? It's the cheapest. So they follow uh, the, you know, the, the system. They're using the cheapest way to get a solution. Sometimes they just need someone to make a, make a decision and that's it. Then they proceed from there, all right? So that's how it is. Other issues, of course, parties, if they're insolvent, they're bankrupt, what happens, all right? Nothing, you can't get anything from them. So that's the other problem, yeah? And the courts must be supportive. As always, uh, anything, all these processes, if the courts are not supportive, then you're not gonna get anywhere. Okay, let's go back to the PEM uh, contract itself. If you look at the PEM contract, it's very narrow. Adjudication is only for set-offs, very clear, set-offs only, all right? So it's not, uh, again, is it a condition precedent? Yes. If you want to refer the set-offs to arbitration, it has to be adjudicated before practical completion, all right? And then after practical completion, if you're not happy with the decision, you arbitrate. So that's how the contract is set up. So you have to, otherwise you can just wait until the project is finished, is completed, then you just go straight into arbitration. So you forget about all this uh, condition precedent. That's fine as well. Right? You can do it later, so no issue. Okay. okay. These are the procedures to follow if you want to uh, set off. Okay. Employer can set off, 
yeah, the parts that are not disputed by the contractor. But the parts that are disputed, he cannot do so. All right? He has to go for adjudication. So it's contractual and it's only for set-offs. Nothing to do with SIPA. Okay? It's a separate system by itself. All right? However, SIPA can look at also set-off. So you have this, uh, if you like, um, dichotomy. You choose either A or B. So you can choose, but SIPA covers everything. So as a party, it's up to you. You decide. You know, what's the best? And normally, of course, we will always, if there's a dispute, the client will always consult a lawyer. So again, the lawyers have a very uh, strong influence as to what procedure to follow. Okay, so that's how it works, unfortunately. The architect, if the architect wants to say something, the client will say, I'll check with the lawyer, I'll check with the lawyer. All right, so that's where you lose out, unfortunately. Yeah. And of course, if you look at the, the last box there, yeah, again, you go to PEM adjudication, okay, it's a condition precedent. So if you want to go, go and arbitrate that before practical completion, it has to be done. So you have to stop your arbitration. If you've gone ahead with arbitration, you have to stop it and then go back to adjudication first. Then after that condition precedent is done, proceed to arbitration, if that's your intention. Okay? A lot of people will do it after practical completion. Easier, less messier, and of course, you don't antagonize the employer, yeah, the client. That's how it works. Yeah? Everybody wants to be nice. Yeah? And they fight later. That's, that's life. Okay. This is what the contract says. Yeah? If you look at the contract itself, it's very clear. Okay. Uh, again, the procedure is detailed in there. Uh, again, it's good that it's in our contract because there's less abuse. Previously, there's a lot of abuse. Contra the employer will just set off Huge amounts, yeah, okay, for this and that. You just set it off from the contractor and the contractor has no other way of, uh, no other recourse. So again, if you look at the, the PEM contract itself, contractor is to, okay, with the architect wants to set off a certain amount, he has to write to the contractor and notify the contractor. Contractor then has to respond in 21 days. That's what it says there, 21 days. And uh, after the contractor has responded, the parties then start to negotiate. 21 days as well. All right. If there's no agreement, then they, they somehow have to, okay, fine, let's adjudicate. So another 21 days. And if, so they get an adjudicator in there. All right, fine. 21 days. If they fail to do that, then they refer to the PEM president. Another 21 days. Then the PEM president appoints an adjudicator. He will then make a decision in 21 days time. So total 105 calendar days. You get your decision according to the PEM contract. That's it. 105 days, calendar days. That's how the system works. Okay. It's there in the 2006 and also 2018. All right. Show of hands, how many have used this clause before? Anybody? Has anybody here used this before? Oh, one. Very good. Two. Okay. So it, it works because there's no complaint from the contractor. All right. Contractor says, fine or maybe the amounts are small, correct? I think that's how it is. If they have a dispute, then they'll say, hang on, you're not, I will, I, I am disputing this. Let's either go for adjudication, yeah? Or we wait until the end, final account, then we'll go to arbitration, yeah? So, okay, two, so it's, it's okay. Somebody, at least somebody's using it, all right? So again, either party, if there's a dispute, either party. So the employer or the contractor can go to adjudication under PEM, eh? under PEM. So until the decision is made, you cannot uh, set off the amounts. Okay. Now, again, uh, in terms of time frame, you're talking about 105 calendar days. So if there's a dispute of set offs, 105 days, you get a decision, then you can move from there. So that's how the system is supposed to be. If you look at the contract itself, uh, these are all the clauses for set off. So again, it's quite straightforward. Yeah? Uh, 2.4, if you start from the top of the list, failure of contractor to comply with AIs, you know, fees, levies, and charges, uh, setting out, uh, work not accord in accordance with the contract. You can leave the works, the, the, if you want to call it the works that are not according to the contract, you can leave it there and you make a deduction from the contractor. 
uh, there's a fa failure of contractor to comply with your instructions, warranty of title of goods and materials. So it's quite straightforward. Yeah, you there's an undertaking as well. They fail to comply with the undertaking, and then the employer pays a third party clause fifteen point three b, yeah, and uh, fifteen point three c as well. You can leave the works there, deduct from the contractor. There's a schedule of defects, defective works, fifteen point four. 15.5, uh, instruction to make good defects and contractor doesn't do it. 19.5, insurance again. All right. And 20.8.3, insurance with licensed insurance companies. So um, these are, I call it manageable amounts. They're not so controversial. Yeah, again. Okay, this is uh, in, in the contract itself. So you can look at it. These are the items that you're allowed to set off. Okay, in the time contract. Okay, any questions so far? Everybody okay? Okay. So in looking at the set-offs, this is what the architect is supposed to be looking at. Okay, when you assess those set-offs, those items for set-off, yeah, you look at the set-offs, you look at your AIs that, that were issued, how valid, were they valid, were they AIs issued, and the works, were they done properly? Yeah, you look at your VOs and how you, the valuation of the VOs, uh, look at payments as well. Yeah, were they properly paid? Were they not paid? Uh, hundred percent. Then, uh, of course, were there any consents given? Any consent or approvals given for the for the work? Yeah, for the AIs, for the variations, and of course, whatever's agreed by the parties or in the contract itself. So that's what the architect will be doing. Yeah, when they assess uh, items for set off. Now, how does it work? There is a PEM uh, adjudication rules 2020. So they have that. Yeah, it's not on the website, but it's there. If you request from PEM, they will definitely uh, furnish that to you. Now, again, if you look at it, it's decided by one adjudicator. PEM president appoints one, all right, under, under rule three. So representation is not so clear. Yeah, whether you represent yourself, whether a claims consultant can represent you, but what's clear is it says parties cannot be represented by, a law by lawyers at a hearing or conference. So Mr. Chang will feel discriminated. That's why he, yeah, he wants to, you know, doesn't want to stay that long in PEM because of that. Because we seem to be discriminating against lawyers. So again, that's why our adjudication is not so popular with lawyers. So that's another reason why yeah, we discriminate against people like him, unfortunately. So the adjudicator has uh, a few duties. Yeah, look at it. He's got to be he or she has to be independent, impartial. That's normal. Yeah, proceed expeditiously. He or she has only twenty one days. You, know, you got to remember that twenty one days to come up with the solution with the decision. So obviously it's got to be fast. Yeah, uh, comply with natural justice again. Natural justice, you know, is so I, I call it nebulous. Yeah, everybody wants to you know talk about natural justice, natural justice, injustice. Uh, only the lawyers can explain you know, what they actually truly mean, natural justice. Uh, then you have to come up with decisions as well, your recent decision, yeah, and it's all confidential. Okay, now if you look at it, the adjudicator under PEM, yeah, PEM adjudication has a lot of powers. There you go. And it, interestingly enough, you can also widen the adjudicator's uh, scope. Uh, and uh, you know you can add other things in there if you want to, not just set off for certain things, but you can add, either ask the adjudicator to look at other things which you want to. That's possible as well. However, both parties must agree. If you don't agree, then the adjudicator cannot look at other matters. So when that happens, you can uh, propose new rules or changes in the rules to help you uh, achieve that. All right. So it's interesting. So it allows for that as well. Okay, in terms of timing, if you look at it, it's fast. Uh, 21 days, that's it. Uh, these are calendar days, all right? And uh, again, excluding public holidays. So if there's public holidays, you add on to that. And uh, further seven days, if you need more time, you as adjudicator, you can add another seven days, yeah? And further extension, the parties have to agree, okay? 
And the thing you to watch out for is if you exceed the deadline, sorry, no fees for you. You you have you're not being paid. So again, it's important to follow the time time frame, the deadline. Okay. So that's how it works. Uh, if you think 21 days is uh, tough, uh, Singapore is only 14 days. All right. So there you go. So if Singapore can do it, I'm sure Malaysia will live. That's how that's how it is, right? Yeah, that's the industry. Okay, now if you look at the decision itself, it's binding until practical completion, right? A adjudicator has made a decision, it's binding until practical completion. If you don't like it, you write to the other side to say, I want to refer this to arbitration within six weeks of the decision. And then after that, parties can proceed to arbitration or they can just settle. They say, all right, fine, I, I have the decision. Uh, let's settle this. That's fine as well. Okay, so to enforce it, you go to court. That's what the rules say. You go to court to register as a court judgment. But I think you need a lawyer for that. You can't do it yourself. Yeah? So you have, still have to employ a lawyer, unfortunately. So you spend some money there to get the lawyers involved. Okay, how, does this, uh, how will this be more popular? I think when the parties have confidence in the adjudicator's experience, yeah, the expertise and the skill, that's one way of doing it. You have confidence. You want uh, an architect uh, to adjudicate that matter. Secondly, you have to accept that in 21 days, you're not going to have a perfect decision. So as long as you have a decision yeah, that's impartial and independent. And uh, of course, your issues of fact and law are, are confined. Don't argue about fact and law. You just tell them, tell the adjudicator this is the fact and there's not much issues with the law. So then the adjudicator can proceed and make a decision. Now, again, if you look at the, I think the, the only way to do that is uh, perhaps nominate your adjudicator. If you can say perhaps PAM president, PAM president or you know, somebody in council, you can nominate them, then at least the parties have that, con that confidence rather than leave it to the PAM. Uh, if you have somebody in mind, I think that that is uh, also another way of doing it. Yeah. So at least you have confidence that, that whoever that person is, is known to you and, and you also know uh, the person's uh, capability. I think that's also important. So that's how it can work. Now, SIPA. This is the, I, uh, the new system uh, that has overshadowed our PEM adjudication, unfortunately. So it's mandatory, it's by law. So you can't avoid it. You can't contract out of it. It is there. So you live with this system called SIPA. Okay. What is SIPA? That's what it stands for. Construction Industry Payment and Adjudication Act 2012. That's what SIPA stands for. Again, the purpose, if you look at it, yeah, fine. You know, regular and timely payment, speedy dispute resolution, that's all there. Yeah, these are all the problems in the industry as we know it. Okay. Pay first, argue later, alleviate cash flow, temporary binding, fine. Uh, those of you who are familiar with SIPA, you used it, you say, yes, it works. Those of you on the other end of the wrong end of the decision, you'll say, oh my goodness, you know, uh, they have a lot of complaints about the system, but that's how it is. Yeah? So you have to then live with this system of uh, SIPA. Well, it's better than nothing and it's cheaper. So that's why everybody seems to be very gung-ho. Yeah? Uh, definitely cheaper than lawyer's fees. Yeah? So that's why everybody, yeah, that's the way to go. But sometimes... You know, you have disputes of 5 million, 100 million, you go and adjudicate. I tell you, it's a mess, especially final account. You try and doing that. Your own final account, you can't even close. Yeah? And you're there trying to figure out how to settle or resolve this other party's final account mess. So let's be practical about this. All right? It's going to be very tough. All right? And you have boxes and boxes and files and files, or files and documents. How are you going to read through all that when it's not even your project? Okay, and understand that. So that's another limitation. All right, unless you're Superman, then it's different. Okay, is it necessary? Of course it's necessary because that's the system that we have in place. Again, all these systems come up because there's a reason. Existing systems don't work. Right? That's why they come up with another system. So that's how you know, the system or the you know, responds to the problem. Yeah? So again, this is the problem we have in the industry. Yeah? It's inefficient, dispute resolution takes, takes time. You go to arbitration, you go to court, it takes time. Yeah? Uh, the courts are faster, but again, 
long some cases bigger cases more complicated cases take a long time it may take two three four years right it's not uh, again and if the judges change another another headache for you yeah they get promoted so in the next judge will take over so it's not that um i call it not that uh, convenient. Also, they must understand construction disputes. That's also very important. If the judge does not understand the construction dispute, then I think you have a big problem. Yeah. Uh, project financing again. You know, projects money. Where does the employer get the money from? How does he finance or she finance the project? Nobody knows. Yeah. So all these issues, non under certification. That's us, unfortunately. Which somehow, if you look at it, uh, we are again. Whether you like it or not, either overly cautious, yeah, or we just uh, try to please our our client. So these are all issues that we have to, you know, understand in 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 the industry as well. None of you want to offend your client, yeah, I'm sure, right? So again, you try to be nice to them. That's a problem. Only when they they don't pay you, then you realize, oh my goodness, I have a problem, right? Uh, again, their financial resources, you have no idea how much money they have or how much money they don't have, right? No idea. So again, whether the contractual mechanism is, has failed, again, it's again back to contract administration. Did you misadminister the contract? Or in your mind, this is the way to do it, but you're not sure. Or as you know, they always say, cowboy, just bulldoze. This is your decision. Go ahead with it. Fine whatever however you you practice all right so hopefully you know things work out at the end all right so that's why it goes back to the last point eh? lack of impartiality independence everybody seems to be jumping on that hey, you're not independent yeah you're paid by the employer this is natural that's what the lawyers will always say yeah you're biased and all that so that's another issue uh with sipa okay now Again, what has it turned out to be? Yeah? Adjudication is more, more legalistic, unfortunately. Lawyers have come in, so that's how it is. Yeah? You want to be self-represented, it's a bit tough. In terms of statistics, uh, claimants, uh, if you go to SIPA, the claimant, generally 15% are self-represented. Majority are by claims consultants, lawyers. These are the two they represent. But in by respondents, interestingly enough, statistics show 75% are, are self-represented. So somehow they just go there and just say, fine, I'm a respondent. 75% they represent themselves. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So uh, perhaps it's it's the way the, the, the system is such. You are claiming for something, so obviously you are more gung-ho, you have a lot of resources. So you want to show that yes, you know, this is what I'm entitled to. So the other side knows that, well, you know, too bad. I owe you money, but you go and try and uh, convince the adjudicator. So that's the system. Yeah, again, it's uh, inefficient and diluted because end of the day, it's about payment, right? But then now it's like going through the whole court process. Yeah? To get payment, you have to go through the different levels of court. You appeal and appeal, appeal. So it doesn't make sense. Yeah, And again, focus. It's not focused anymore. Yeah. It's very intimidating for smaller like subcontractors and all that. Yeah, it becomes like fast track arbitration or mini arbitration. That's how you know people are looking at it and saying, "Oh, my goodness." Yeah, and of course the courts now. When you go to court, of course, what do they look at? They look at your legal arguments. Yeah, rather than okay, fine, you owe this money. I'm going to now help resolve for the payment. Instead, they look at the legal uh, aspects of it. So that's not what the system is. Yeah, it's for payment, right? To release payment, to certify payment, pay the, the work has been done, pay the contractor or subcontractor. That's it, right? It's simple. Or the consultant. Yeah. But consultants, unfortunately, consultants, unfortunately, uh, somehow they are so passionate in their work. Yeah. They don't think about money. They just think of, you know, the passion. Yeah? So that's the difference between contractors, uh, between consultants contractors and even lawyers yeah they don't work for free unfortunately but consultants you are so passionate right air and water is good enough for you to survive yeah yeah so that's that's how it is yeah the system then again if you look at it when the lawyers come in what happens adjudicators who are not uh 
if you want to call it legally trained, they have a problem because they then have to overcome all these issues, uh, legal arguments. So that's what ha is happening now. If you look at adjudications, the first thing they do, they stop you by throwing in a lot of court judgments and telling you, you can't move. So the adjudicator is stuck. He or she cannot move until you deal with the legal issue. But the system is for payment. How can payment be stopped by legal issue? That is something, you look at it fundamentally, something is wrong with the system, right? Something is wrong. Yeah, it's been overtaken by all the other players in the, in the market, in the, in the industry. And of course, they complain the fees don't commensurate. Of course, the fees don't. That's how it is. Maximum fee, if you look at the AIC scale, $50,000. $50,000. Your claim can be $100 million, $50,000. How can you expect to do justice or to do devote time to that? You cannot. Yeah? But they give you all sorts of, end of the day, these are the things that you must sort out for them. So back to, again, what is reasonable, what is you know, practical, can you achieve all these things for such a small sum of money, just like all of you. Yeah? Your fees are too low, but it's different, you see. Architects, even low fees, you will still do it. That's the problem, you see. Whereas for lawyers, they don't do it. If the fees are not enough, they're not going to do it. That's how it, lawyers will work for free. I don't think so. Oh, national service, okay. We have Mr. Chang there willing to do it for national service. All right. So there you go. So that's the system you have. So I, I call it, it's, it's not ideal. It's already been uh, modified or I call it uh, overtaken yeah, by other players in the industry itself. So that's what's happened to adjudication. All right. All right. This is interesting. Practice. This is a uh, practice yeah, for all of you here. Um, adjudication case actually it started off in adjudication uh, I won't name the architect you can google it and you'll find out who the architect is again it's a PEM 2006 contract yeah? three, o three EOTs were submitted to the architect All right, architect granted two 19 days issued CNC uh, LD was one, one million plus okay so again in court they were fighting and employer said hey you can't uh, I, I dispute the EOT because contractor did not give notice yeah, for the delay. Under PEM 2006, you have to give notice 28 days from the commencement of the delay, 28 days after the delay. So that's in the contract. But contractor didn't do that. But architects still assess. Architect, you know, all architects are very nice people. So they will still assess it. Right? So again, the architect took more than a month to request for additional information. And after that, more than two months to assess EOT. He assessed it, no problem, given. Okay. And in court, the employer said, no, EOT should not be given because the contractor did not give notice, did not follow the condition precedent. Okay. And the court said, yeah, architect, you do not have the right to waive any contractual rights on behalf of the employer yeah, unless the employer accepts the waiver. Okay. So if the employer doesn't accept it, you have no right to do so. You follow the contract strictly. Okay, that's, that's the, the, again, uh, the outcome of this, this uh, particular decision. Yeah? Architects, you have to be careful with your contractual conditions precedent. Follow it strictly. In the past, if you look at it 10 years ago, the courts were not so strict. Now, the courts are very strict, especially loss and expense. So you have to then be very careful about it. Yeah? So the courts will look at the actual conduct of the party rather than the conduct of the architect. The architect can be a hero and, you know, as an agent for the employer, he, he or she can do whatever he wants. But at the end of the day, the court will look at the parties, okay, whether they have accepted it or not. So that is the, um, this particular case has shown that, all right? So don't be heroes. I think you have to look at it. And those architects that give, you know, sometimes two years, three years EOT, be careful because the employer can always turn around and not recognize it, unfortunately. Then you are left hanging there. Again, everybody will be looking at you, what happened? Okay, so again, uh, the one that feels very sore about this is of course the contractor. How come I have to play by the rules but the architect doesn't have to play by the rules? Too bad, right? So it's still in your favor, architects. Yeah? You can do whatever you want, how long, whatever, it doesn't matter. But again, just be careful, condition precedent, all right? So that's how it is. Okay, any questions? No questions?
Uh, yes, but again, you have to look at it in terms of uh, what you have now. You have SIPA. You compare the PEM adjudication is basically toothless. Yeah? Basically, the lawyers still prefer SIPA because it's, a, it's an act. Yeah? So by law, that's how it's supposed to work. So they will prefer that. Yeah? That's how it is, unfortunately. And then you have to clear, clarify whether lawyers are supposed to be in, can they be involved in PEM adjudication? Now you exclude them from the hearings. So if I'm a lawyer, you don't include me at in the hearings, but can I assist or can I prepare the documentation? Otherwise, end of the day, the cost, who is going to pay for my cost? I can't claim I win, but the adjud adjudicator has excluded my cost because it says lawyers are not allowed to participate. So there's that kind of uh, uh, um, uncertainty there. You have to be certain first. And PAM, I think PAM adjudication is good for fees, basically. You can get a PAM to appoint adjudicator an architect adjudicator to assess the fees. I think that is better. You have um, you know, a fairer way. Pardon? And it is under the pen form. You can. Your fees for the project. So you must put it in a way, write it in a way that it is associated either with or in association with or whatever, how you word the clause, then you can. I mean, there's nothing to stop you from getting a, an architect to adjudicate something. As long as the parties agree, that's fine. No issue. Yeah, but I think that gives you some certainty. Yeah. Getting a lawyer, I think, uh, you know, with respect to the lawyers, yeah, they overnight, they are very good. Yeah. But then certain things, they will not know how you uh, start to uh, build your clients or how, how you, you formulate your, your fees to clients. They will not know. Yeah. So when they come in as adjudicators, you're going to have a problem. They don't understand it. So they will go back to the contract again. What does the contract say? That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think you, you look at your uh, relevant events yeah, for EOT. Is uh, shortage of labor a relevant event? Look at that first. Does it say it is? If it does not appear, then you can't grant. You, know? you don't have the power to grant EOT at all. Yeah. So maybe you can look at it ex gratia. That's another way of looking at it. That means the parties then have to go and go outside the contract and just have a, uh, some sort of private discussion between themselves and agree on something. That's the only way to do it because you don't have the power to grant. There's no relevant event for you to do so. And if you do so, you're, you're not uh, acting according to the contract. You don't have the power to do so. Yeah. yeah, you can. I mean, you can always talk to your employer and, and tell the employer, look, you know, it's a national issue. I think ex gratia wise, you should, you know, try and talk to the contractor because otherwise there will be an impact to this project. Right? I'm sure he doesn't want to. Uh, get a new contractor, it will cost him more and there'll be more delay as well, right? A new contractor coming in. So he has to understand that. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're running short of time. So please hold your burning questions until the end of the uh, last speaker session. And uh, please thank Mr. David Chia for his insightful talk. Thank you. Okay. We are now going to take a 15 minute break. Uh, please proceed up to the rooftop where you'll be getting uh, drinks and refreshments upstairs. And we will be back here 11.15 sharp. Everyone okay with that time? Okay, we'll see you down back here at 11.15. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, we Earlier on we had concluded the uh, talk Sorry. 
Thank you again to David Chia just now for uh, the second topic that he presented just before our break. Uh, he gave a very, very in-depth and detailed explanation as uh, on adjudication just now. If you all caught it just now, he not only covered adjudication in the PAM contract, he also covered under SEPA, which means that all of you actually got two for the price of one. That's wonderful. Now, um, it's time for me to introduce uh, the third honorary speaker. She's an architect, an adjudicator, a mediator, an arbitrator, a SIPA consultant, an accredited building inspector, an expert determiner, and an expert witness. In her statement of belief, she says that there's always a better way and platform to minimize dispute slash stress in our life. And I think she re refers to dispute resolution. In her, in, in, as part of her belief as well, she's going all outwards to create an awareness by providing advice to avoid complicated and costly litigation processes by number one, dispute avoidance, which equivalents to preventive action plan, and number two, dispute mitigation slash resolution which is equivalent to corrective action plan. This speaker gave a very delightful and positive spin on dispute resolution in a talk for Pam at the end of last year called JOMO, which is called Joy of Missing Out equals dispute resolution. For all you all missed out, she may give the talk again one day in the future. Please, and the topic that she's giving us today is called mediation, a good alternative for dispute resolution. Please put your hands together for Ms. Hing Si Im. Okay, a very good morning to everyone. Hope that you have a good break. And uh, if any one of you fall asleep, don't worry. I will send a pillow over. And it's not your problem, it's my problem. Because as a speaker, once any participant fall asleep, it's our problem. Okay? Now, uh, thanks, uh, Architect Chong, for the kind introduction. And thank you for having me here. I'm going to talk about topic of mediation. As you can see on my slide here, there's a question below. Is it a good alternative for dispute resolution? Okay, let's check it out together at the end of my presentation. We will revisit these questions again and let's see how many of you agree with this. Okay, there are two, uh, three objectives I want to meet today, which is the first one, I'll give you an overview of what mediation is all about. What is mediation? We keep on talking about mediation, but what is it? Secondly, is mediation helpful to us as an architect? If the answer is yes, how helpful is that? The third one, how are we as an architect can play a role in mediation? They are the, these are the three objectives I want to achieve today at the end of my presentation. So in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to talk about an overview of mediation. What is mediation? My actual cases, I have two actual stories to tell, which is my own personal experience by using mediation. And then I'll share with you what is the beauty of mediation. I'll end my presentation with a summary. Okay, let's move on. The first topic, overview. Now, we all are very familiar that there is a mediation clause in our PEM contract. Clause 34, PEM contract 2018, be it with or without quantity, they are the same. And then clause 28 for PEM subcontract 2018. Now, let's look at this. Clause 34.1 for the first sentence. Let me enlarge it so you can see it clearly. Upon the written agreement of both the employer and contractor, the parties may refer any dispute for mediation. Just pause for a while. Can you see the wording? Upon the written agreement. That means there must be an agreement and that agreement has to be written. Okay? Both employer and contractor. Of course, this is a PAM contract. If let's say the subcontract is contractor and main contractor, uh, subcontractor and main contractor, parties may. May means it's not mandatory. You can opt out for mediation. Refer any dispute. Any dispute. Just now, architect David Chia talking about a set off. You can go for adjudication under PEM contract. And even SIPA, you can go for adjudication for payment. 
Okay, for mediation, any dispute, that means dispute not involving payment, not involving set off, uh, perhaps it's some dispute that parties having conflict, a difference in terms of opinion, you can go for mediation. Now, let's move on to the second part, which is clause 34.2. Let me enlarge it. It read like this, prior reference of the dispute to mediation shall not be a condition precedent for its reference to adjudication or arbitration by either the contractor or employer. What does that mean? It simply says that you no need to go for mediation, you can straight go for adjudication or arbitration. That means it's not mandatory. It's not like uh, you, it's a must for you to go for mediation first before you can uh, uh, pursue your case in adjudication or arbitration. There are some cases whereby mediation, arbitration go concurrently, or mediation, adjudication go concurrently, right? So it's flexible. Now, second part of it, nor shall any of their rights to refer to the dispute to adjudication or arbitration of this condition be in any way prejudiced or affected by this clause. It simply means that mediation shall not prejudice the party's right to adjudication or arbitration. If let's say you go for mediation, you have the mediation settlement agreement with you, there's one party that didn't honour, they don't honour what has been agreed upon, you can proceed to adjudication or arbitration. And what has been agreed upon in the mediation, it just can just put away, it won't affect the arbitration or adjudication decision. Okay? Now, whenever parties are in conflict, right, do you think they can talk to each other? Maybe the claimant want to talk, but the other parties that just want to cut off, don't want to communicate anymore, especially for big disputed amount, uh, this, uh, construction dispute. So as an architect, we have been uh, engaged for various projects, from mixed development, a complex project, a bungalow project, up to some renovation work, such as roof renovation, and involved internal renovation, also involve repainting and tiling work. So my questions to you now, whenever there is a construction dispute, do you think it only happened in complex projects? Do you think it only happened during construction period? And do you think it only happened in between employer contractor or contractor subcontractor? Questions to ponder, right? The answer is simply no. It can happen in any project, be it big or small project. It can happen anytime. Maybe at the design stage, we will have some conflict with our employer, developer, our client, and anyone. We are looking construction project, uh, construction dispute in a, a, a whole spectrum, which means from day one, design start until the end of the construction stage. So it will involve suppliers, designers, ID, so, so many people will get involved in the project itself. So anyone, you can get into a dispute very easily. Now, you already have an overview uh, in terms of mediation uh, in time contract. So what is mediation? We keep on talking about mediation. What exactly mediation is? How is it? Let me show you this. Mediation is only is a voluntary process which uh, parties in dispute come before a mediator as a communication channel to reach a amicable settlement. Why I said communication channel? Mediator is there to facilitate. Okay, They are not there to help parties to solve dispute. And normally parties won't talk to each other. So they need a neutral third party to help them to communicate. Right. So this is basically how mediation looks like. It's very informal, unlike the court proceeding in the courtroom. Employer, contractor sit in front of the mediator, just like having a meeting. Very casual, very comfortable. And as I said before, mediator only act as facilitator, to facilitate, to assist the party. They are not there to solve the party dispute. As a mediator, you are not forced that party have to resolve their dispute as well. It's up to them whether they want to resolve it or not. We're only there to facilitate. Okay, now, how about mediation process? What process that mediation involves? I think some of you here may already involved in mediation before. 
So just, just uh, uh, I simplify the whole thing because the, the process can be a very lengthy process, but just a major key five stages process that we will go through in the mediation. First, we are uh, starting off with the opening statement by the mediator, like an introduction. Then we will go for joint discussion. That means mediator discuss with both parties. And then we will move on to private discussion. Mediator will spend equal time with each party at the same time. Um, why we must have a private discussion? There are a lot of time mediation, um, a lot of parties, they don't talk to each other and they have their own reason why, which they don't want the other parties to know it. But through a mediator, mediator can facilitate that and help them to actually uh, uh, vent it out when having a private discussion. Then after the private discussion, we'll go back to joint discussion with the hope that parties will settle the dispute with an amicable settlement. This is a rather simple uh, process, but in actual fact, um, it can go actually from joint discussion, go to private discussion, then you go back to joint discussion and then private discussion. Yeah, it can go a few rounds, right? So I understand, I think now you have overview, what is mediation, how it works, a general idea. Now, my questions to you, what is architect's role in mediation? Can we actually play a role or not in the process of mediation? Can we actually wear a mediator hat when resolving our own project construction dispute? So that brings us to another section of my presentation, which I'm going to share with you two of my personal story. Because of the time con concern, I can only share two here. I actually have a lot more that I can uh, discuss with all of you. Uh, I will start with a very basic case, which is um, I'm uh, employed as the architect for this particular project. It's the first project in my own company. So these projects involve neighbors and neighbors dispute. Mm, it's a extension renovation job for double story terrace house in Balik Pulau, Penang. Now, a very minor uh, renovation job. You can see here is the extension of the main door. And then my clients changed the original glass uh, to the uh, brick wall. So this is a close-up view, a very minor project. This is an internal renovation. So we only add up the additional uh, water tapping point. And also we top up by ha having the, um, we close up the uh, window opening by having top up the, uh, some of the brickwork here. And then uh, my client intend to have a new uh, full wall tiles at the kitchen, just a very minor work. So now, what happened was um, when the construction is ongoing, this is a very short construction, easily about one month, we can uh, just wrap it up. So in the midst of the construction, right, my client actually received a complaint from the neighbors. So as an architect, when we receive a complaint, we always um, worry that they will go and complain to Majlis. Because when you submit any renovation work, our client will actually undertake that. They will go and make good all those defects that possibly caused by the construction job. Right, so I just went and have a look. I asked for the uh, neighbors to just give me permission. I just want to check what is happening. And what he showed me was this. This is actually a soffit of a cup of ceiling whereby the paint peeled off. Now, I took a 40 meter to check. The moisture content eventually is 80.3, which is very high moisture content inside a concrete slab. As you can see from the previous photo, there is a balcony on top of this. Now, let's have a look. What you can see here, a water ponding. It's like a fish pond. Okay, and next to it, dampness on the wall. So as an experienced uh, architect, you can tell that this is not happening one or two days. It's over the years, right? Not months, it's years. Okay. So, of course, I asked the neighbor, I said, Uncle, what happened to your balcony? Is it always like this? He said, yeah, every time after heavy rainfall, it's like this. So I said, okay, I understand. But you know very well, it's not my client construction that caused this. But I hold back to my answer. Sometimes when we see there are some dispute happening, we don't direct tell them upfront that, no, we are not the root cause of your problem. Right, that will cut them off and they will shut off, just don't want to talk. So just bear with it. And then 
I move on and ask, Uncle, then what else can we see in your house? Uh, you have further others complain that uh, you said caused by our construction. He said, yes. So he bring me to downstairs. This is what we find out. A hand eye crack on the wall. Very common, right? Just a very common uh, construction dispute in this particular case. Now, in order to give you an overall picture, where is the exact location? This is my client's unit. We only did the renovation here. As you can see, this is the original. So we actually pushed the front door out extension. And then this is the kitchen side where we actually do some renovation. Now, the defective area is actually here. Let me refresh you, your memory. This is a ponding area. And then this is the wall whereby there is a hair eye crack. So by looking at all this, I think roughly as an architect, you know what is the root cause and why, and whether my clients is the root cause for all these things, have to be responsible for all these things or not. I think you are very clear on this. But anyway, um, I just want to understand more so that we don't uh, um, try to annoy the other party. So I explained the situation to the uncle. I said, uncle, look, this is only our own renovation, these two parts. I invited him, in fact, to go inside the house. So this is the party wall, I said. And your defect is happened here. Now, I said, as an architect, I can tell you honestly that I know what is the root cause. You want to know or not? It's like talking to a layman, you know, you have to bring down yourself to talk to them, to understand. And he's a very nice old man. He said, okay, okay, I just want to know. I thought it's your construction. I said, it's okay. I just explained one by one. I said, balcony water ponding, the root cause. I identified three uh, potential root cause. But the first one, defective water pooling, I think is, is there. We can see because of defective water pooling, that's why the paint peel off. Okay. And that's possible because of the gradient problem. The gradient flow is not enough. And even though if the gradient is right, Perhaps there is some blockages at the river to down pipe. So I explained one by one to him in a layman term. And he kind of like agreed with me. And I also talked to him and said, just now I heard you say that it happened quite frequently whenever there is a drain down pour. He agreed. So it means we already opt this out already. We are not going to responsible for this. Okay, this is out. Now, this part. Wall plastering. I also explained to him in the layman way why, what is the root cause of this. But somehow he cannot accept. He keep on saying that because of the vibration caused the hair eye crack. Yeah. So I can't do anything much. I don't want to argue more. So what I can do is just to understand. I said, okay, uncle, I, I hear you. I understand that. But um, what is your concern here? He said, I just worry that the wall plastering will actually get worse and worse, and then the wall will collapse. I said, no, it won't happen in that way. So try to explain in a more um, technical way and uh, so that he can understand and appreciate more why. Okay, he's still not convinced enough. Never mind, I asked another question. So I said, uncle, is there anything that we can do so that to let you feel better? Okay. So when this question was asked, he said, yeah, 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 I want somebody to help me to patch up. But it's not patch up that easy, you know. I still need to explain to him. So if let's say we straight forward and go and patch up, and the outcome is not what he wants, he may actually just have another dispute after one dispute, right? So I explained to him, it may not look good. By doing a localized patching up, first we have to cut it localized, and then how are you going to patch up? there will be a painting work involved and it won't synchronize the whole thing. You, you will saw, see a lot of patchy things here and there. It will make things worse. Then he keep on thinking and thinking and then after a few days, he come back to my client and said, uh, I think it's okay, I'll take it. I'll just take it. But what he want, me to, uh, want us to do for him is try to get the contractor to quote him for the balcony waterproofing. He said it's very hard to get contractor to come in to do a minor job like this. So I said, fine, we can actually communicate with the contractor, ask them to talk to each other, to discuss with direct to the uncle itself, see how they are going to sort it out. Because since they are there, I do believe it's okay for them to actually carry on with this. All right, so that's end my first case. So this case actually have an amicable settlement uh, through the mediation skill. Now, 
my question is to you, as an architect, can we actually wear a mediator's hat or not? And in what way we can do that? It's actually very simple. I think all of you here already qualified as a mediator. It's just that maybe you're not aware. So what is the mediation skill that I, I actually practice here? First, I have to build the trust. Mediation is about building trust, rapport, because uh, with my client, I have no problem. But with the other party, which I don't know him, he will be a bit reluctant to listen to me. But how am I going to build the trust? So that uh, make, take, uh, take a lot of effort, like, in fact. So that's why we have to bring ourselves down to talk as a layman, to talk in their language as much as we can so that we can close the gap. So once you build the trust, it's easy for you to talk, to discuss further. So second thing, active listening. We keep on talking. We hardly just pause and listen and catch the words. Right. In mediation, as a mediator, we need to just ask questions and then let parties talk. Once they talk, then your job is uh, as simple as just take the notes. Right? You take notes on what they, they just told you and end of the day, you just, yeah, I hear you. At least you confirm that you actually hear them. You're not agree to them, you know, I hear you. And then we have to go with the open mind. We always prejudge. We are human. It's very normal. So when you see just now the photos of water ponding, I know everyone of you say that definitely it's not my client's fault, right? So that is prejudge. I had the same problem, but don't say it out. Just let it be first, and then we justify after that. Okay, empathy. Empathy means it's not sympathy, you know. You have to put yourself in other people's shoes to feel how they feel. Just like, yeah, I hear you, I understand. So the choice of words is very important in order to have a good mediation uh, a settlement. So this is my uh, first story. My second story in, is a bit interesting in the way that uh, I'm appointed as an expert witness in this particular case to justify, to reassess an EOT assessment which was done by the other architect. So my client is a contractor. This is a dispute between contractor and developer. It's a hotel project. So contract signed with the original contract sum of 2.14 million. And then VO cost 60K. The revised contract sum is 2.2 million. Amount in dispute is 680K. It's not that much. As for adjudication case, not that much. Arbitration case as well. It's just a small amount of dispute. But what caught you in surprise is EOT was not granted even a single day. Okay? So, which caused the liquidated damages about 1.3 million. Now, when I look at it, I was like, okay, I just take it up and see what can I do. This case, as I said, is actually go to court already. And the court have a court mediation. So, the judge actually get parties to go for court mediation. And they didn't turn up well. So, they go back to the court for a normal court proceeding. So, I take all the documents with me. I go back and study. So I only confine my scope to EOT, just reassess the EOT, which was assessed by another architect. So what I find out was uh, my client actually did not comply to condition precedent, like what just now uh, architect David Chia was, taking, uh, was talking about in the Eco City uh, case. The, all the notices was not served and insufficient information was provided. So how, as an architect, we can assess without all this information being provided, okay? Even the condition precedent is not complied with. So I have no choice. I have to really go back to my client to tell them the truth. I don't want to just quickly do my report and then submit it and then I just uh, live with it. So there's not um, the right thing to do lah, for me at that moment. So I go back to my client, explain the situation. I said, look, you are not complying the condition precedent of a contract. And there's insufficient information for you to actually uh, put in front of the architect, ask them to assess accordingly. I quote you an example. Inclement weather. A lot of contractors like to use this clause to claim for EOT. But what they submit? Weather chart. Yeah, weather chart. So can that is... Can there be an evidence for you to assess that, oh yeah, you can get the EOT as what you applied for? No, right? So the architect is doing the, the uh, 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 right job lah, in this case. So 
after that, I told my client up front, I said, now you are paying me as an expert to stand in court. I can tell you that my report is not going to support your case. You are going to lose the case. He was very frustrated and then he was very angry with me. He said, no, my lawyer said I can win. He just said like that to me. I said, are you sure your lawyer said like that? Can you please ask your lawyer to guarantee? Uh, write a guarantee letter. If let's say you didn't win, you, could do, uh, you don't need to pay them. So he just keep quiet. I said, none of the lawyers will say this. In fact. So, okay. Then keep on explaining to him why I said that uh, he will lose the case. So he looked very down. So out of nowhere, I don't know why I have this courage. I, uh, uh, I actually asked for his concern. I said, actually, what do you actually concern the most for this particular uh, case? He said, I worry I have no money to pay for the 1.3 million if let's say I lose the case. Then what else? My whole company, I don't have enough uh, uh, this uh, cash flow. So how am I going to survive? That's why I want to claim back my 680K. And I don't even know they will counterclaim us 1.3 million. Now, so if let's say there is a way for us to settle the dispute, what is your main objective now? What you want to achieve at the end of the day? He said, um, if let's say, I, according to what you said, I didn't comply to the condition president. I don't have enough information. So what is the point I fight to the court? So if let's say you can settle, I can actually get a little bit back. And but 1.3 million, how? I, I am I'm more worried on 1.3 million. That is what he, he told me. So I said, okay, now, if there is a way for us to settle, are you willing to try it? He said, okay. Then he asked me, how? I said, go mediation. He immediately banged the table. He said, Miss Hay, are you kidding me? I just came back for court mediation, which is a failure to me. And now you get, back, get me back to mediation. He said, the other party won't agree. I said, I understand. Let's try something else that we can do by using mediation skill to help you to resolve your dispute. Do you have any choice? I asked him. You're going to court, you can wait, wait until the court hearing, and then you know already upfront you are going to lose the case. Or you are willing to try something else so that to mitigate, or perhaps there are some good turnout, you, you won't know. If let's say it's still, it's just back to square one only, right? You didn't lose anything. Okay, then he listened to me. I asked him for his last offer. If you were to settle this dispute, how much can you offer? What is your last call? You must have a minimum uh, a figure for you to go and talk. He said, perhaps I only get back maybe 100K, 300K. Okay, fine. But how about the 1.3 million? If let's say they stand firm, you must pay. What should you do? He just paused a little while. Uh, is there anything that outstanding uh, in that particular project. He said, actually, yes, it's defect. He admit that he haven't done all the rectification work. So now, this is the interest of the parties that you won't know without asking a lot more questions to actually let them talk, reveal the truth, why. Okay, so now I tell him, I will do it an uh, informal way of mediation. What I mean informal way is like, I'm not in the position to go and mediate for you. The other party won't agree for mediation. I, I, I can assure that. And how am I going to do that? Uh, I said informal way, meaning you are going to face the party yourself, but I assist you from behind. This is what I did. So I said, let's discuss how to get this sorted out. So I said, first, you must go and apologize first. Just now you said, you know there's a list of defects you haven't closed up and then you just want to run away from the job so just apologize first put down your ego there's no ego once you raise your ego you, you can't talk you just can't talk you have to just put yourself down uh, uh get them to agree that yeah it's your mistake right and then acknowledge them what i mean by that i said is there anything that the employer did uh, a good things for you throughout the construction period he said, yes, they are a good paymaster. Just that lately, uh, after uh, some payments has been done, but some certificate issued, but they want to pay me. That's why they hold back 680K. And then they impose 1.3 million. Yeah, acknowledge that. 
they are not a, a worse paymaster, they is a good paymaster. And along the way, they also actually help you up as well. Now, I also told, told him that you have to know your position. You have no way out. Go to court. I assure you, you are going to lose your case. And with now, you have to do something to help yourself in order to get out of this dispute. So you have to know your position. Don't go there and don't raise your voice. Don't bang the table. Just talk nicely as gentlemen talk. Now, as just now I asked you, what is your concern? Ask the other party back, what is their concern in this particular dispute? Okay, understand their concern. Lastly, ask, what can you do in order to let them feel better? So these are the few key things that playing around with mediation skill. Of course, um, there are some, a lot more, just that I just can cover uh, this, this much at this particular time. Now, uh, what happened was, uh, this case settled, settled through informal mediation way. Of course, it's not that simple. That's just uh, what I mentioned to you in the last few slides. We have actually gone through a few rounds of discussion and how to strategize it, how to do it so that we can close the case. Now, so they settle it with uh, the employer wants the contractor to rectify all the defects plus extend the defect liability period. So this case is in court December 2017. So the court hearing fixed in May 2019. I have to be in court in May 2019. So what happened was the case settled in January 2019. I still remember um, it's about one week before the Chinese New Year in 2019. He called me up, said, Miss Heng, I'm very happy today. I get it done. I said, what's that? He said, you can have lottery. Yeah. It's like very happy, you know, you can, you can feel the, 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 the joy, the happiness, celebrating kind of things. He said, no, 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 this is more than that. We settled the case. The case, they remember that you helped us in formal way. Oh, okay. I didn't expect that. In fact, I didn't expect that because it's too big amount, 1.3 million. So he said the case withdrawn. Of course, all those mediation skills, I only can assist them. But as a contractor or as a businessman, I can say that they are a more rounded person than us especially than me like, as a consultant, I'm not that rounded enough. So they know how to talk. So you need to have some persuasive skill. You need to have some, uh, uh, how to say, negotiation skill as well. So how you actually mix all those skills together to get it done. So the amount you dispute is 680K, as I said just now. Uh, LAD is 1.3 million. So settlement amount is only 200. They get back 200. And they are happy, they are happy with that. So this case is amicable settled. Uh, through a mediation skill. It's not a formal mediation, it's an informal way of, uh, of working out how to help them. Now, back to the question, as an architect, can we wear a mediator hat or not in resolving construction dispute? What is the mediation skill that we need to apply? Right, again, build the trust. I don't know this client of mine, it's out of nowhere, they call me up. Somebody recommend that you can actually stand in court for our case. Uh, because we hardly get architect willingly to go to court. I said, okay, fine. So I, I don't know them. So just through conversation, day in, day out, I talk to them. Uh, at least you show your genuineness that you really want to help. You are not there to make money from them. Okay. So you have to discover common interests. Just now I talk about money, right? One side, they want 680K. The other side, they want to counterclaim 1.3 million. So all because of money. My client won the money because they said they already done the job, but they forgot that there are some rectification job they haven't done, which may need money as well for the other side. So these are some common things that we can mark down. When you listen to them, you can mark down all those common things that both parties can actually uh, uh, develop more. How are they going to, to, to actually settle it? Then general option. I generate many, many, many options for this particular case. I have no intention to have an informal mediation. It's just that happened like clicking my head, like maybe I should help. Because my role is as an expert. I already engage, I signed my letter of appointment already, in fact. So I'm not supposed to do that. And I have to do that without the lawyer get involved, without the lawyer knowing about this. You know. Okay, so empathy as well. We have to stand at their position to understand why why they feel that way and why this happened and how they actually uh, overcome it in terms of emotionally stressed accounting, empathy. 
and reality check. I did a lot of reality check for this case. I asked a lot of, uh, uh, we call it worst case scenario. I said, if let's say you were going to lose this case in court, what you see in the next five years time for your company? He said, don't talk about next five years. I don't even know I can survive for the next project or not. I don't have enough cash flow. And I need to pay you, I need to pay the lawyer, I need to go to, uh, I need to pay a lot of unnecessary things. Uh. I said, okay. So don't you think you should actually go all out to try it out and see whether it can work or not? Now, you already hear about my two Sorry, One is an architect, one as an expert witness turned an informal, like, um, can say consultant to help them to resolve their dispute. Now, so what is the beauty of mediation that you can see in my presentation? We always talk about the facts. The facts is only the tip of the iceberg. What you can't see is the underlying interest of the parties. Mediation, we always want to discover and explore parties' interests, which they may not tell the other party, but they can share with the mediator privately. So it's up to the mediator to pick up the point and see how to match them together. This is involve a lot of effort when during a mediation. Litigation, no, talk about facts only. That's why we always say records, records, records. Right, documents, 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 all about facts. You go to court, it's all about facts. Even adjudication, arbitration, expert determination is the same. Now, next. You heard about win-win situation, right? What is win-win? Nobody lose. In mediation, each party take what they want, they move on with their life. In litigation, no. Either you win or you lose. That's why there are so many cases from high court to federal court. In order to keep the relationship, Mediation is a good way to keep a good relationship, whereby there are some cases that I heard about is they even offer the other party for another job. Let's say you manage to give me some discount without paying you for this job. Okay, so as a contractor, right, sometimes they longing for another job because they have to keep the company run in, the, in, in a, a good manner. Cash flow is a problem here. So they managed to talk, just store it a bit, never mind, I give a discount, but I want to secure the other job from you. So this is all the underlying interest in all the parties, which in litigation, you won't talk about it. And in litigation, I don't know whether parties can still work together after a court case or not. I have no idea with that, but I think it's quite hard. So is lawyer needed? My question is to you, is mediation lawyer needed? Anyone? Is lawyer needed, yes or no? Yes and no. Yeah, I heard the, the answer yes and no. Actually, direct answer is no. But for a multi-million dollars claim, sometimes they will need a lawyer to be beside them so that they can feel more comfortable and more confident to appear in the mediation. Litigation, you cannot run away from the lawyers, okay? And the lawyer's fees, you know, they calculate by per hour, some of the, the star lawyers. Okay. In terms of time, mediation. I think, Anthony, I heard that you have a talk in this uh, Penang about KRIA2. Your mediation settled in nine days, right? If let's say you were going to court, don't know how long is that. So mediation is definitely save time. And I heard a lot of dispute actually settled within one day. I have a mentor whereby is a mediator in Singapore. He is an architect by profession, a 70 plus years old uh, architect. Uh, Averagely, he get mediation appointments to six to seven mediation appointments per year. And his record is one day he can settle. Yeah. And of course, there are some 20% of the cases that he can't settle, but by reaching 80% of the settlement is very good already. That means you cut down 80% of the case, go to adjudication or arbitration. Okay. And that will also help us as an architect. So litigation, it won't save time. Just now my case, 2017 already in court. 2019 is the the hearing. So how long it will take and you will drag time and that will create stress as well for the parties in dispute. So money, when you talk about no need lawyer, uh, cut down the time, of course, you will save a lot of costs in here and litigation, no, you have to pay your lawyers. Now, after talk about beauty of mediation, you have overall picture about what's happening. So as a summary, you know what is mediation? Back to the questions that I, I flashed out in my first slide. Is mediation a good alternative for dispute resolution? How many say yes? Definitely is a yes. 
But another question I would ask, how helpful is that? Actually, it helps us to manage conflict. It helps us to be proactive. It helps us to take a lot of preventive action before the things turn worst. And how? How are we going to do that as an architect? By applying mediation skill. I do believe all of you here already equipped with that skill, just that you didn't aware. And now is the time for you to brush up the skill. How are you going to help the parties in your own project to settle their dispute? You can always say that I already done my job as an architect. I already issue my certificate. Client don't want to pay them, it's up to them, it's not my problem. Don't forget. One day, if let's say the case end up in arbitration or in court, you need to be called as a witness of fact to be there. So can you have time to actually sit down with the lawyers to go through all the documents? Can you have time to, to uh, trash out all the documents, which is maybe many, many years ago? Can you have time actually go to the court and can you face the stress or not by uh, in front of the lawyer? When you go to court, it's not that simple. The lawyer will take any single uh, opportunity to grill you, okay? So perhaps by that time, you also don't have the memory. What is that project about, right? Because day in, day out, we have too many things ongoing. So always apply mediation skill whenever you sense that there are some dispute that may happen. Now, I have actually two books to share with you about mediation. The first one is Mediation Skill and Techniques. This is a very good book, very simple uh, book. It's like reading a storybook. You can actually buy it for 85 ringgit. It's very cheap. And this is a lawyer. Uh, is a practicing lawyer. I don't know how, how old is he now because I buy this book for quite some time already. So uh, you can read it. You will find it very interesting. You'll find a lot of things that are, what, what he mentioned inside the book. You already have it. Just that you don't know that you they are not aware about the skill that you already have it, how to brush it up, how to actually fine tune it so that you can help you in your daily life, not only for construction dispute. Mediation is very good for uh, family dispute, uh, community dispute. Okay. Second book, Practice and Procedure of Mediation. This is a bit comprehensive from uh, the first step until the end, how to draft a mediation settlement. This book is cost uh, 350 ringgit. You can get it online as well. So I, I just can recommend these two books for you because I'm having these two books and I'm actually referring to them. Now, I want to emphasize again my uh, main message today. Whenever there's a construction dispute, always go for mediation. Don't opt for litigation or maybe adjudication, arbitration, unless you have no choice, okay? Why I said so? According to Abraham Lincoln, a good settlement is better than a good lawsuit. Thank you very much for your time and kind attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Hin Im. Thank you for sharing with us such personal stories, and I think it was uh, quite a delightful uh, to, to hear her personal stories. In fact, uh, Ms. Hing Sim also imparted an extra uh, skill to all of us. I'm not sure if you're aware of all this. It's also called the Blue Ocean Strategy. She's actually created jobs out of nowhere, you know, for herself. So that's something else to learn from her. Okay. Um, We're now coming on to the final speaker for today. Um, she's an architect, an arbitrator, an adjudicator, a mediator, an expert determiner, and an accredited building inspector. She's an architect for more than 40 years, experienced in the process of design through project implementation and contract administration. She has a track record in residential, commercial, hospitality, and institutional projects with varied forms of contracts. She's also an expert practitioner in the art of ADR. And she's also uh, spoken in PAM about the art of ADR as well at the beginning of this year. The topic for today is called expert determination to avoid costly dispute journeys. Please put your hands together for Ms. Manaha Ramanath.
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So my session this morning, thank you, Mr. Chong, for introducing me and for council members and president who came earlier uh, and also his plan for ADR uh, from 2023 onwards. So my session this morning is to enlighten contract administrators on the intention of PAM expert determination. It is a flexible alternative dispute resolution procedure with a decision by an independent third party known as an expert. The expert is chosen for specialized expertise on the specific issue that is disagreed by the parties. And the expert determination has been incorporated in PAM form of contract 218. Expert PAM, ex uh, I'm referring only to PAM expert determination in relation to the PAM form of contract 218 for a simple informal and contractual process for dispute resolution that has become a very useful uh, technical as well as valuation issues during the construction period. So many of us who are contract administrators are aware that construction projects today compared to the 80s and 90s have become more complex in terms of materials, construction methods and equipment to operate and maintain the buildings and surrounds. The sites now are not individual sites, they're tightly surrounded by existing development or in very remote locations. Time frames for construction periods are no longer phase by phase. That means to say uh, schematic design, design development, tender documentation, contract imp implementation goes step by step in the 80s and 90s, but now they are simultaneous. I've had that experience myself. So sites for new projects, uh, let me see. So several activities are concurrent. So, what I, what I press? Expert determination is not governed by legislation or procedural rules, except rules agreed between the parties to suit the circumstance and the choice and type of disputes to be referred to an expert. And this is to marshal an agreeable solution. The disputes could be a disagreement over a specific technical or engineering issue or specialized or varied expectations of delivery hence timely and economic determination during the contract period to facilitate progress and delay. So in the PAM form of contract, clause 35.1, it says disputes on all matters. And as explained earlier, Expert determination shall not prejudice the party's rights to adjudication or arbitration. For everyone to be aware, PAM has got PAM arbitration rules, PAM mediation rules, PAM adjudication rules, and PAM expert determination rules. And as far as the fees for the PAM uh, architects who are appointed, it comes under the Competitions Act. So what PAM has got is guidelines. So it's for whoever needs their expertise to talk to them. If you study the expert determination rules, first you have, if you come to a disagreement, you have to come to an agreement to do expert determination within 28 days. If you can't agree, then you uh, agree on an expert, you have to prepare a memorandum and apply to the president of PAM to appoint an expert. 
if you read the rules, it adds up to about 100 and, uh, let me see, about 142, 142 days to 147 days. So if you want to reduce that time, you can If you want a prompt expert determination, the appointed expert is an independent third party with specialized knowledge to resolve the specific technical and valuation issues in dispute during the contract period, which the parties to the contract have agreed beforehand to comply. So the building and construction contracts to be preemptive and drafted clearly the PAM form itself has conditions of contract. But as you're aware, in the uh, upfront document of the contract, you can then, if it's a very complex project, you can actually prescribe the issues the expert has authority to determine. The expert is given complete documents and submissions from both parties for detailed study and issuance of expert determination, which is final and binding. So what is the goal of expert determination? To provide an early resolution for the parties who have contractually agreed to participate toward a voluntary, consensual, and timely agreement to rely on an expert determination. As, as, as opposed to having a dispute escalate to litigation for court judgment or arbitration at the end of the construct, construction period, causing animosity and delay to the performance and closure of the contract. What that means is, if there's a problem, you see it, you want to solve it at the bud of it and not wait until everybody stops talking and then looking for other ways for ADR. The value of expert determination. Firstly, it is an independent, expert determination. It is during the construction phase. It is flexible to suit the nature, size, and complexity of the disputed issues. It is to achieve performance, time, and cost according to the predetermined parameters for delivery. What is the meaning of predetermined parameters for delivery? If it is a condominium project and you have if the developer has sold the properties to purchasers, there is an end date by which you must deliver. If you are involved in the construction of a sports stadium for an international uh, game like football, that stadium must be ready by a certain time. It is a complex uh, design when it comes to stadiums. If you are doing a university, the school program is such, it's going to open on such a date. So that's the meaning of predetermined parameters for delivery. There is an end date that must be achieved. But during construction, from my own experience, when you have construction drawings, it's only 70% of the answer. It's only when you go onto the site and actually stand on the ground, see the excavation, see the construction, you'll start to see that there are issues that need to be solved by an expert very quickly. So expert determination is cost-effective and prompt. It resets the party's expectations on the delivery of the specific affected work. It avoids being penny-wise and pound-foolish. I'm very, very against value engineering during construction. It should be done before the award of contract. As you're aware, a lot of value engineering goes on during construction, which you are not aware, and then you end up having to carry the baby. So, who is 
the expert. Looks like the PDF is a bit different from my sheet. Some words are missing. missing. Aptitude of the expert determinator. Has to be confidential, impartial, independent, have integrity, high standard of technical knowledge, objective, professional expertise in the specialist area, and must be a professional in that area. Appointing parties must have equality and cooperation of the parties. They must have full disclosure of contractual and factual issues, specific on the technical and or valuation issue, understand limitations and jurisdiction, private contractual arrangement. What does this mean? Because some of us are aware that it's now a design and build situation. So it's between the employer and the contractor. It is usually not between the employer and the architect, but it's in construction dispute using the PAM form where both parties must have full disclosure of the contractual and factual issues. It means they must be willing right at the start to have an expert determinator. And if they know they are going to foresee, if they foresee that an expert is needed during construction before the works are covered, for example, in the foundation works, and then when you're already at superstructure, it's too late to solve your problem that is below ground level. So you must have uh, knowledge that you may need experts during construction while the cement is still wet. Construction issues referred for expert determination. Some of us are accredited architects with uh, Architect Center. So we have seen uh, some of these things on the ground. And from that experience, I'm making this list of uh, technical issues for determination by an expert. Defects mitigation to achieve performance and quality standards. Sometimes it's in the assembly of the components. Feasible construction methods for efficiency, speed, and safety. That could be expertise in the type of formwork you use. Preliminaries, provisions for sufficient manpower, safety, and site. If you are in an urban site with another tall building beside, how do you then prop the uh, boundary of your basement wall while you're doing concreting? Shop drawings for specialist works. There are all kinds of uh, glazing works now and, and you really need expertise, not just two dimensional drawings, but the way the, uh, for example, if you have curtain wall, how is the glass being set in the ground to avoid vibration, etc. Technicalities of materials and equipment fit for purpose. Technology for automation and AI integration, especially now that you are putting in uh, things like uh, charging stations for electric cars, uh, robotics. I've seen uh, a session on robots doing inspection and sending videos back to the H H of HQ. Now you can even use drones for site inspection. Value engineering during construction, varied geotechnical soil conditions. These are just some examples. The other thing is, if you want to avoid adjudication, et cetera, and you need an expert to make some sort of settlement during construction, and you need quantification issues, it could be to avoid liquid, uh, dam liquid, uh, liquidated damages, loss and expense, 
loss of opportunity and profit, remeasurement of provisional sums, valuation of variations. How it's done is that the parties sometimes talk to each other and they vary the contract in the form of a supplementary contract. Just to come to an agreement so that the project can move on and complete to avoid all the other ADR processes. Expert determination considerations before contract award. It shouldn't be an idea that is thought of during construction, but it should be discussed and considered where experts might be needed during construction. Requirements, issues, protocol for an expert to prepare an expert determination are predetermined before the award of the building or construction contract. The need for an expert is based on the nature, complexity, and scope of the project. Timelines for expert determination during the construction period with agreement of the parties. Regular briefing by the project team on the issues to be determined by an expert for direction from the parties. Monitor the implementation of the expert determination and appraise the results for any improvements or modifications. Because expert determination under the PAM form of contract is final and binding. It's technical in nature. Once you have specified something, it's built to replace it and repair it and what have you is going to be even more costly. So it's better to have expertise before you build so that you don't get into that situation. So expert determination protocol, the best way forward is parties can choose the expert they want to deal with on the relevant issues, a significant advantage where the dispute requires knowledge of complicated issues. The contract grants authority to the expert and is not backed by a statute. Expert determination is to provide clear and precise reasoning to enable the parties to understand the full basis of the determination. Expert determination maintains privacy. Expert does have inquisitorial powers. Expert has no statutory immunity. I have seen some precedent cases, which I just read through in Google. Uh, I think there was a case where uh, experts report determination was looked at, but uh, the uh, expert determination was uh, accepted by the court. Because during construction when a decision is made and then you go forward on it, you've agreed to it contractually. It's a contractual agreement. You've agreed to it, something is built, you then no point, you can't go back to court and sue the expert. These, based on my homework on technology today, the specialized areas for expert determination with the advent of technology is, there are all kinds of air conditioning systems, I've uh, seen card access and security systems which are old, you can't repair, you have to replace the whole thing because it's out of date and doesn't function. Communication systems, uh, internet and so on, curtain wall system, foundation system. For example, once the foundations are built and you carry on, you can't see what's in the ground especially when we are called in to inspect for settlement, et cetera. I've seen settlement in link houses where the walls, party walls are all going down in uh, different depths. Precast panel system, big pieces of panel system, covered system, have to be watertight, rainwater harvesting system, Recycled fluids, materials, and equipment, especially now when we're going for GBI ratings. Reduce energy consumption. Surface water drainage system. A lot of times, surface water drainage system has not been built efficiently. They are undersized. I think some of you may have heard that Buildings are being built, plot ratio of one is to 10 in an area where originally it's supposed to be one is to three. The infrastructure is only designed for 
plot ratio of one is to three, and then your drains are all flooded. Floods, floods into your building. Can't just blame the rain all the time. Water supply distribution pipe. There are all kinds of pipes. Is it for washing? Is it for food? Is it for a factory that is doing food production? You need an expert on the quality of water and what kind of pipes. I put in Verendil truss or cantilever beam. This is something that is decided right in the beginning when you are before even starting structural works. So those are just some ideas I put down. So Albert Einstein said, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. Why I say that is that we are all architects. Many times when we advise our clients, they're not listening. They're only looking at the bottom line dollars and cents. So it's very important that if we have done our homework and we are giving good advice, please put it in writing so that when anything happens in future, if they want to put the blame on you, you just take this letter and put it in front of them, you are safe. Why I'm also putting this is because when we are doing designs, we are doing a lot of homework to prepare the client brief, project brief. And we are talking to people who think they know all the answers after traveling here and there, they want this, want that. But mediocre minds means they only have general knowledge. They don't have the in-depth knowledge, especially when you need to have proper specifications to make things watertight for air conditioning systems to work to the right levels. And here, when they talk about air conditioning, they're only talking about cooling air. But now that the COVID-19 has come, you can see that air conditioning is, it should be pollution free, must be able to uh, kill viruses, temperature control and humidity control. So that's why I'm saying that we have taken even longer than doctors to become registered architects. And we have to have so many years of internship and training to become architects. And then we are talking to people who have not had our training, but want to tell us how things should be done. So that's why Albert Einstein, nobody listened to him in the beginning, but in the end, his law applies to our construction. Thank you. I like the balance sign. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Manaha, for such a in-depth talk with us. Uh, the next session we're going to go into is uh, the Q&A panel session, um, where we're going to invite all the speakers onto the stage, and we will take questions from the floor as well as from the virtual attendees. Please give us a few minutes for the uh, organizers to, to set this up. Can I please uh, invite our three esteemed speakers to the stage? Uh, Mr. David Chia, Mr. Hing, Ms. Hing, and Manaha. Okay, um, there's been quite a few questions in the virtual um, Q&A box. Maybe we have a procedure where we'll um, take one question from the floor and then take one question from virtually, just to be fair to both sides. Uh, first question from the floor, anyone? 
If not, I'll read out the first question um, within here. Well, the first question is about the sign out code. So I'll leave that to the organizers to answer that. Uh, the next relevant question is, under the new PAM form of contract 2018, is the SO still legally implemented slash stated under the construction period? I'm not sure if it's relevant to ADR. What's the question again? Under the new PAM form of contract, is the SO still legally implemented, stated under the construction period? Actually, it's, I think it's not a very clear question. Um, whoever wrote this virtually, maybe you want to clarify a bit more. Um, what, do you, what do you mean specifically can, by this? I can add something there. PAM form of contract says the architect, but there are many parties who engaged non-architects as the SO, they slash out the word architect, and then they put in the uh, uh, preambles that the architect refers to an SO, who is a non-architect. I have seen arbitration, uh, arbitration cases where that has happened. But the architect is put on one side, not much to say. So I think that's why that question came. Thank you, Manaha. Uh, any questions from the floor? We'll take one from the floor now. Uh, this gentleman in blue first. Yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Maneha, uh, you, you, you give an interesting quote from Einstein, but I'm more uh, touched with your statement about we are being, uh, we are trained much longer than even doctors to be architects. Um, I'm, I'm 60 years old, David asked me this morning what I'm doing, so I'm, I'm almost retired. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing that I want to say is that um, as I grew up this profession, when I graduate, there was only arbitrator in the contract. And then we have adjudicator. And then later we have mediator. PAM 2018, we have expert determination. The current architects, uh, the, uh, the current contract being reviewed, probably we have a new one. Again? Probably we have a new ADR coming in. Because over the years, we seem to be getting more and more term for people who actually do these alternative dispute, dispute resolutions in our contract. Okay, the point that I want to make is that why are we as an architect in our own contract appear to be giving away our rights, things that our client, our contractors have respected us all along. Whether we are mediator or expert determinator or, or adjudicator, they have always referred to us first. Okay, but it seems now that you, you have to wear another hat. You have to wear the mediator hat to, to, to judge on something. You have to wear the adjudicator hat to, wear on, on, on to, to, to make decision on something. My worry is that we ourselves are giving away that, that right that we used to have. By, giving, by, by creating more and more terminologies, more and more, uh, you know, uh, create posts, a new post uh, to, to the contract resolution. But because from my experience, I think 80% uh, of disputes is ego. You know, it means with me, you know, it's all about ego. Uh, Sometimes it's about us waiting uh, long enough towards the end when the work is completed. And they, 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 they can see, see each other. Because we, we, we happen to, because the way I see it, I'm, so, I'm sorry if I see it this way. Sometimes when we are, we are asking them to go to arbitration or adjudication, we are actually uh, pouring fuel to the, to the fire. You cannot agree to this, go and fight. 
all the while, time contract says that when there is a dispute and until there is a dispute resolution, architect's decision takes precedence. I think, uh, I, I hope when we, we can look into this and uh, give us back that, that, that rights and respect. Thank you. I think you answered the question yourself. <laughs> And I think uh, Manaha uh, gave the talk very well. If we are all really good contract administrators and maybe running our own projects, the dispute most likely will not occur, really. Can I ask a question? How many of you have got projects that have gone for dispute resolution? Please raise your hands. Yeah, everything, everything. I know everyone is recording this. I like to say this to people. None of my projects have gone for dispute resolution unless they have a uh, employer and contractor have a financial arrangement that is beyond the jurisdiction of the contract. Why I'm saying this is that, that's why I talked about expert determination as architect King also mentioned, you have mediation skills. If you get the trust of the parties during construction, then you avoid all these disputes. But to take your point about why we're having so many words and so on. Last time, you come from a time when buildings were only 20 stories high. And you have a plot of land and you have a building. Straightforward, nothing to dispute about. But now, our uh, construction, methods, our projects have all become very complex. But if you use skills as mentioned by architect Heng on mediation and get things sorted out during construction or before construction, don't wait until the last minute, then you end up with this sort of situation of ADR. Thank you, Minaha. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna ask the next question from the virtual. And I think this is probably something David Chia can help us to answer. Um, can a contractor challenge every provision for set off? Would the PAM contract 30, clause 30.4 be meaningless or broken if the contractor challenges every provision for set off? Under, under the contract, it is the contractor's right to do so. Yeah, If he disputes it, definitely you have to go for uh, adjudication. That's it. Yeah, It's his right, his contractual right. You can't remove that from him. Even though he might be difficult or whatever it is, he has you know uh, grounds or grievances that has somebody has to to determine or decide that. So he says it's not fair. Uh, I need someone, a third party, to come in and, and resolve this. Fine, that's his right. So you have no choice. That's it's it, it's in the contract. So you have to follow your contract, whether you like it or not. You might think that well, the contractor is being unreasonable, but that's his right, right? So you can't do you can't take it away from him. Even though you think, wow, everything you're challenging, that is right. That's why it says under the contract. So you have no option. Just go for adjudication. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any questions from the floor? That gentleman in the middle. Good afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Arman. Okay. Um, it's actually, it's... Um, I want to share a case of ours in terms of dispute of fees, uh, which is involved quite a few parties. Although at the end, the result is quite sore, but there's something that I hope um, Pam or the ADR committee can take this up to look into this escape clause. Um, we have a project, it's a, a mixed development project, um, and we are appointed as a lead consultant together with all the sub consultant under us. Uh, appointment properly signed. Um, project is going for KM submission. But towards uh, the uh, about to submit for KM, uh, this developer have a new parties coming in, a new funder. So they totally disregard. They say, okay, they want to change the whole thing. They want to change the entire whole consultant team. And by uh, all of a sudden, we just receive a letter of submission without any signal. So um, we asked, we, we have a, a few meeting with them. So we understand, okay, fine. So, uh, but just pay us the, all the works that we have done. 
And they said, no, nope, we're not going to pay a single cent. Then um, the cases that were because of that, um, the, uh, the developer filed uh, Malay, uh, the bar council, the uh, Malaysian arbitrate, uh, the mediation center, looking at on the point of the architect refused to issue letter of release. We told them, you want me to let issue you a letter of release? Can, provided you pay the fee. Lah. So they said, no, I will not, I'm not going to pay a single fee, cent. So because of the, uh, the bar council, the mediation center, putting on the point of uh, refusing or issue the letter of release and asked to mediate on that matter. So we reply back saying that, look, the issue, it is not about letter of release. The issue is on the dispute of fee payment. If the mediation center willing to take on on that uh, perspective, yes, we can come. We reply and mediation center, keep quiet. So yeah, totally. Then after a while, um, we received a letter from the mother saying that uh, the uh, client has, uh, the uh, uh, developer has filed the, um, the court case in industrial court. So because of that, asked us to, to reply what's happening. Then we reply all these uh, good, true and false kind of letters. And last, um, Lembaga using the clauses saying that because the case has got into litigation with the issue of letter release. So whatever between the architect and you and the developer, you settle in court. That in industrial court, um, technically we won the case, but because the, the, the developer still refused to pay a single cent until even the judge said, I don't think that, that this person is going to pay a, pay a single cent. Uh, even you're the file in arbitration also, I think it's waste of money. Might as well just end all the losses. So what I would wish Pam or, or the committee or with all the experts here can look into this as clip clause in Lembaga. Even we ask Lembaga, why are you, it's the dispute of fee, it's, it's not on misconduct or whatever thing. And even we ask, is that possible we can have the letter that whatever the developer sent to you? No, we are not allowed to disclose. And the method just closed. I think, I really think that this is very, very unfair and also uh, because of that escape clause in the lembaga, the, 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 the thing. So um, I wish, the, uh, Pam, because this is also on dispute on, on the, uh, we try to do things that what needed to check up by by nothing happened. So yeah, so that's something that um, uh, is a sharing of story and I hope this thing can bring up it at a higher level. Thank you. Thank you for bringing up. I don't think this is something that uh, our experts here can answer you, but your grouse is valid. And the, um, the power of the letter release is not as it was several decades ago, it is. So that's something to be taken up at a different forum. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, please. Um, you said that your case already filed to Malaysia Mediation Center, right? Filed by the other party. And then you refused to, to you replied. Okay, uh, what I'm trying to see things from another angle is why not just take up first? When you go for mediation, you can explore more further on that and then uh, just vent out your concern to the mediator it perhaps won't escalate until that extent. So for all of us here to learn, uh, sometimes it's don't uh, jump too fast to get the conclusion. Don't prejudge first. Yeah, there is a black and white stated that you have to come for mediation for this particular issue. But as I said, mediation is exploring underlying interest, right? I know you have all the facts with you, but you have to understand further what is that behind that you won't know and on your case, perhaps it's very uh, um, direct. It's like just about fees, right? And then second step you can take forward, of course, it's not a good advice, which I've done for my own case. I actually uh, sued my own clients for my uh, fees payment. Uh, mediation cannot settle. So you have to go for another step already to get back what you deserve to have. So instead of go for litigation, and then now because the case in court, and then Pam issue a letter in that sense, 
uh, yeah, lembaga is, yeah. So it's like the whole things become worse and worse. The scenario deteriorate. It doesn't help you. So sometimes it's better to pause a while. No harm to just sit in and listen. What are they going to say? Mediation is um, it's not force you have to agree on certain things. It's up to parties. Once you are willing to settle, mediator is okay with that. Perhaps you can get a good mediator. There are numbers of good mediators in the market. Yeah. So in future, perhaps you can just, just have an open mind, go and listen what they want to say. And then only that you can vent your concern. Yeah, yeah that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Missy. I'm gonna. I, I I want to add okay. on that. I've done some arbitrations for Lambaga Architect Malaysia. So the first thing that all architects must do: please read your Architects Act thoroughly. And as mentioned earlier about condition precedent, if you've got a termination letter, immediately. Uh, prepare your invoices and bills and the total amount owed to you, write to Lambaga to appoint an arbitrator. And then there is a procedure that Lambaga will do for you to, for, for that matter, to go into arbitration. Why I say that is that if you don't follow the condition precedent, once you're terminated, there's 60 days that you're still responsible for the project. Another 60 days so that if your project, if you are terminated while the project is under construction, for example, can't afford to have a project not without an architect. So please read your Architects Act thoroughly. There is condition precedent that you must write to Lambaga Architect. Then only Lambaga Architect can take action. But if you go a meandering way elsewhere, then Lambaga has got no, nothing else to say except to say, carry on. So the, 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 the letter of release will then be given, but it's gone into arbitration, and then the arbitrator has to make a decision, and that becomes final and binding. Of release. That's correct. Yeah. So as soon as you're terminated, you should immediately write to Lambaga Architect. We did. Or before the litigation. Yes. Oh, so never mind. That's your story. Yeah. I'm just saying that that's what the Architects Act is saying. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just, I'm going to read the next question from the virtual chat box. It's an interesting question. Um, it refers, it's asking for the 2018 contract under valuation. Is it normal practice for the architect just to accept the QS valuation? I think they're referring to certificate of payment. <laughs> Who would like to give some valuable advice on this? <laughs> I, I, I think this... Uh... Again, what is the architect's role? What is the QS's role? You still have uh, responsibility over the valuation, yeah? payment certification valuation. So you cannot just accept. I think in our modern practice is that we accept whatever the QS says. Yeah? He says X amount, you just sign and agree. Yeah? You, that's how it is. Yeah? I'm telling you, okay? By right, you should be looking at what has been valued by the QS and whether you agree or disagree. We disagree, you tell the QS, I want, I want this change. That should be the way. But unfortunately, the way we operate nowadays, all of you just 100% yeah, accept it wholeheartedly without asking questions. Easier, faster, isn't it? I mean, that's the reality of it. But that should not be the way. If you don't like something, something's not done, you go to the site, you can ask for that item to be omitted. right? Or you say, how can you value such a item such a big amount when you know i clearly can see that it's not done right it's all an estimate that's how they do it anyway right so they're estimating as well but if you yourself know for a fact then you should tell the qs yeah, reduce this amount that's that's a proper way of doing it right it's how you you certify payment but we don't do that so sometimes the problem comes when you over over certify something that's when the problem happens when you know the contractor is, is going to do something, for example, 
you're going to terminate the contractor or you know that the contractor is going to run away, then you have a problem to justify to your client why you have over-certified. That is a problem as well. So you have to, you know, you can't just automatically assume. Yeah? So that responsibility still comes over, comes back to you. Right? So irrespective that the QS is actually named in the contract, both the architect and the quantity space also holds liabilities in that respect. In conclusion, that's what David is saying. Okay, can I take one question from the floor? Anyone? Otherwise, I'll go, go back to the chat box again. I think this one is probably for you, missing. In PAM 206 or 201, 2018 contract, can the main contractor ask for mediation directly to the employer without going through or involving the architect? Say for one dispute that relates to EOT, for example. Uh, the simple answer is yes. Yes, they no need to inform the architect they want to go for mediation. Uh, I think your concern is you will be opt-in, right? So it depends on how big the dispute is. There are certain disputes I heard that they need and witnesses to be appear in the mediation. But hardly in mediation case, we'll ask for expert witness or, or witnesses of fact. Lah. Yeah. So they always can go for mediation. So long employer and the contractor, um, they are, have a written agreement, consensus. That means um, voluntarily, they can do that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the floor? Otherwise, I'll keep reading this. <laughs> okay, this is um, a question on arbitration. Uh, is PAM arbitration an institutional administered arbitration of which PAM has a rule where money is collected from the public? as administrative fee and arbitration agreement set within its standard form of building contract that members don't really question, as it is often regarded as midnight clauses and the existence of the panel list of arbitrators? It's a long question. I think the, the, first, uh, the first line is, is PAM arbitration an institutionally administered arbitration? in which PAM has a rule where money is collected from the public as administrative fee. Maybe it's making a comparison with it versus AIAC, which is government funded. Both David and I are on the arbitration panel in the AIAC. Okay, the question is, is it whether it is institution? Probably probably need to explain the difference between PAM uh, formation of arbitration versus AIACs, which is government funded, right? I think that's probably okay. the real question. As far as PAM arbitration is concerned, it arises from clause 37 of the PAM form of contract 2018 or whichever clauses in the previous years. And that means the parties have agreed to arbitration, which says that if they cannot decide on an arbitrator, they will then apply to the president of PAM to appoint an arbitrator. And once the arbitrator is appointed, PAM has no further involvement other than holding the security deposit to be paid by the disputing parties as directed by the arbitrator. And that depends on the nature of the dispute and the uh, amount of the dispute. AIAC is institution, what's the word they used? AIAC is government funded? No, institution. Institutional administered, administered arbitration. So AIAC is institution administered, which means that when the parties decide to have an arbitrator, uh, to be appointed by AIAC, then AIAC will appoint the arbitrator. There's a fixed scale and the parties are uh, asked to uh, pay the amount of the fees 
that is based on the dispute value. And the parties must share the cost and pay. If one party doesn't pay, then the, uh, the first party has to pay everything. And then only the arbitration can proceed. And AIAC will get 20% of the fees in addition as, administ as administration fees. Once the arbitration award is done, it has to go for a technical review by the AIAC. That's the meaning of administered by the AIAC. A lot, all the government projects under the PW contract all say AIAC to appoint the arbitrator. And so at the end of it, when the final award is done, it is deemed to be final and binding doesn't go to court, that's it. So that's the difference. When it comes to PAM arbitration, first, the parties can decide ad hoc, someone that they want to make a decision for them, and that arbitrator is appointed, or they can't agree, president of PAM will appoint, and after the appointment, PAM has no jurisdiction over that arbitration, the arbitrator has to follow the Arbitration Act 2005. Once the award is done, the parties have to take it to court to be enforced. Thank you, Manaha. I think Manaha has also answered the following question from the same person that if PAM is an institutional appointing body via its president's appointment, does the constitution of PAM allow such services to be discharged to the parties in view that PAM is collecting a fee out of these services? I think you've answered that. Well, PAM is only helping the, uh, admi the arbitrator to hold the uh, fees. I would also suggest all architects to study the PAM Constitution review, uh, uh, to study the PAM Constitution. Because I was also Constitution Review Chairman for two years. I've read it back to front, front to back many times. The objectives of what is the PAM Constitution is right there in the front. It's to serve the members and to serve the community. When it comes to arbitration, it's strictly between the two parties. They can ask anybody to appoint the arbitrator under the PAM form. But if they choose to ask the president of PAM, then that's all the president of PAM does. Nothing to do with the constitution or the 2,000 members of PAM. It's a separate affair. So PAM is holding the money for the parties. That's all. And it is dispersed only when the arbitrator gives a direction. Okay, the other line of questions from the same person is also talking about institutional agreement, uh, institutional form from PAM. So I think it pretty much answers all of that. Uh, the next question is um, on adjudication. Note, I think it's from David's uh, talk. Note taken that the provision of PAM adjudication clause is just a toothless tiger as per David Chia's explanation. Why must this clause be retained in the 2018 edition when CPA is already a mandatory statutory education, adjudication? Uh, would it be utterly confusing when either party may opt for CPA in lieu of PAM adjudication? Okay, um, I, I think you have to look at the history of this adjudication clause. Perhaps it was there for uh, in 2006, it was a new thing that um, the drafters put in. Again, maybe it could be to assist. Uh, at that time, there was no differentiation. If you look at SIPA, you can't uh, adjudicate bungalows. Yeah, you can't. So in this case, yes, you can do so. So there's no limit. It doesn't say that you can't. So there's one avenue to resolve that kind of dispute. Otherwise, you go to SIPA, you can't resolve this dispute. right? So in the PEM contract, it allows for this to be done. It doesn't say you can't, it just says anything. So if you have a bungalow dispute, yes, I would think that would be possible to have it adjudicated under the PEM adjudication clause. 
whether uh, it's a, a again it should be there should not be there should be continued i think there's nothing wrong with it it still exists together side by side the two uh, adjudication schemes exist side by side so it's a matter of which you prefer the preference is given to to uh, the users of the pem contract if they feel that like again the other thing is uh, fees architects fees if they feel that well if i can get somebody uh, in in pem to adjudicate my fee dispute with the client so be it i think you know the architect will be more familiar back to, to the purpose. So it's there. It's whether you want to choose to avail yourself to that particular clause or not. If you feel that, yes, I, I, I you know, again, who are your, your advisors? If the lawyers, you listen to your lawyers, the lawyers tell you this thing, you follow your lawyers, that's fine as well. So at the end of the day, it's your rights. What is it that you can, your remedies, whichever, uh, you know, uh, whether it's under the PEM adjudication clause or SIPA, whichever rights remedies you choose, and then you just use whatever method that you feel that you're more comfortable with or whatever you've been advised to do. I think that's, that's all, you know, it's there for you. So you decide. I think that's what the, 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 the contract drafters wanted that way. Yeah, they've given you flexibility, just apply that. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, the last three questions were from the same person, uh, Sulong No Suyaki. No? <laughs> anyway, uh, you have a lot of questions, but I think we got to give somebody else a chance. So I'm going to skip and then go to uh, um, Mr. Irving Tian. His question is this. If a contractor has served notice of default to the employer and then letter of determination for which the supposed default by employer is questionable and debatable, can the architect still recommend alternative dispute resolution now that the contractor has been served the notice of determination? Would there be any changes to procedure for mediation, adjudication, arbitration if the letter of determination has been issued? Yeah, I think for this case, the best is go for mediation first. Nothing much you can do just see what is the underlying interest of both parties. Only then you will see what's next before you jump the gun to straightforward go for maybe litigation or arbitration. Perhaps it doesn't work out. You may not have enough sufficient evidence to support your case, right? So I will suggest a mediation. So it, 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 won't, it won't affect in, in that sense that in the circumstances that the, the questions that come in, you still can go for mediation. It can happen concurrently, even though the notice of determination has been issued. Yeah, right. yeah, can. Okay, hope that answers the question. Um, the next question is from Ho Jialit. And the question says, architects should get a written feedback from respective consultants, example, engineers, to state that their scope of works as valued by QS are acceptable before architects certify payment. That's why I do. I think he was answering the other question earlier. But still, I think David has answered that question quite correctly, that architects' pay are responsible, irrespective of the QS has, has done the certification. Okay. Do we have uh, any more questions? Yes, the gentleman at the back there. Whether it's a building contract or appointment letter to consultant. In our agreement, there is a clause for dispute uh, resolution. There is arbitration clause. Can we skip that and go to SIPA instead? Okay, uh, now you are talking about the agreement in between architect and employer. Building contract. Okay, I'll just tackle the issue of architect and employer. If let's say you drafted a clause in such a way that arbitration is mandatory, whenever there's a dispute, you cannot go for anything else, go for arbitration. Yeah. So if let's say you back to PEM contract, just now uh, we have shared, you can actually go for various concurrently. So you have to go back and read the contract, how it has been drafted. So it's good that to have an ADR clause inside our uh, letter of appointment right, as a terms of appointment, but you have to draft it very carefully so that you have a flexibility there. Yeah, I hope I answer your questions.
Any other questions from the field? If not, let me thank our all three speakers today for their wonderful presentations. Okay. Thank you very much. So we officially declare this um, seminar closed. And thank you very much for coming all the way today. Have a safe journey home. Bye-bye.